All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to the stream today. So we are going to have a very special stream for you all. So today I am streaming with Michael Stoppelberg. If you have not seen it yet, uh, in my chat, I'm going to drop the command. Oh, shoot. Where is it? Uh, multi. So if you go to multi, we have a multi stream link. And you should be able to hear both Michael and I, and you'll be able to view both of our streams. So, uh, Michael, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me OK now after our sound check. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, I have done another stream yesterday, and I'm very happy to be here today uh, with Matt to do some co-programming, uh, pair programming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're both going to work on Router 7. Um, oh, somebody's saying they don't hear sound. Yeah, um, so all the sound is going through all the sound is going through my stream. So you have to yeah. join the multi-stream. Um, unfortunately, for folks on mobile, I am not sure this is going to work. But we're doing it this way because this is the only way to uh, synchronize the audio between ourselves. So yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so people in the chat will have to sort it out, please. Um, so for those of you who can see other people asking for help, please send them the multi-stream link. Um, yeah, we hope this setup works well for today at least, and we can always uh, improve and iterate on it um, if we want to do this again in the future. Um, yeah, so a little bit more about Router 7. So this is a, a Go project of mine, which um, I started a while ago. I've been using it for well over a year at this point, um, and it is essentially a whole a small internet router uh, for your home. So, you know, if you if you think of the typical, I don't know, um, what your ISP gives you for your, like your cable modem or your fiber if you're lucky or your DSL uplink, um, that sort of box is what Router 7 replaces. Um, Matt himself also has like the PC Engine's hardware that is under Router 7 canonically. So we're on the same hardware platform, but he has a different software setup. Um, but we're still going to work a little bit on Router 7 and explain a little bit along the way. And if you have any questions, please let us know in the chat. Um, and we're going to figure out uh, what we're going to work on first. Um, and if you have any input or comments on that, um, please also let us know. Um, on my stream, you can see that I have the issues page open. And I have this label called good for stream, which I've just added to a couple of issues that I thought might both be uh, you know, in, in a good state uh, enough in terms of research that we know what to do. Um, they might be good for explanation. They might be good to get something interesting done. I mean, if you have anything else, please just let us know. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, yes, so a couple questions about multi-stream and possibly merging the broadcasts. So we look into a few different options. This is what seemed to work best for today. Uh, that being said, we can try other things in the future. I think the problem is we tried to embed each other's stream like within OBS, but we were having, we couldn't get the audio to work that way. So. It's, prob it's possible there's a better way to do this. We'll see what we can do in the future. But for now, uh, I recommend the multi-stream. So if you go to my channel, you type uh, multi, you will see the link. And there are folks asking. Yeah, so just folks in chat, please go ahead and share that link. Uh, for folks on mobile, I apologize. If you want audio, come to my stream. Um, we're, we'll do the best we can. We'll try and figure this out better for future. But this is our very first time doing this. And just before the stream, we had my Chrome crashing repeatedly. So uh, hopefully, with any luck, this will continue to work. <laughs> All right, very cool. So, Michael, do we want to get started on the DNS search list stuff? Maybe that'd be very easy. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, let me pull this up here. Okay, um, so I have actually uh, referenced the RFC section uh, because I wasn't aware of DNS SSL actually for the longest time. Like, I knew that in the router advertisements for IPv6 address configuration, you could set like um, the DNS servers themselves with the RDNSS option, but I didn't actually see that they had a DNS SSL for the DNS server search list as well. Um, so that's here. Um, it seems like a simple enough option, right? The diagram here shows uh, we have, you know, type length, reserved lifetime, and then just the domain names of the DNS search list. I don't know in what sort of encoding. I'm sure the uh, RFC will tell us uh, using the techniques in this section. Um, maybe you already know how this works. If yeah, you've already done it. this is the this is like the horrifying like DNS label encoding and. I, uh, I spent a long time one afternoon fighting GoFuzz like with crashers with Unicode handling. So this was all kinds of fun, but I think oh, yeah. I've got most of that worked out by now. Nice. So do you have like a package that will do all of the label stuff for us? Uh, yeah. So I don't actually have that split out into separate code, but the NDP package actually has the DNS search list option, which will do all this for you. So if, if you'd like, I can pull that code up and we can walk through it really quick. Yeah, sure. Okay. Windows popping up all over the place today. So if we go to options, uh, what's it called? So DNS search list. Uh, right, so I'll go ahead and make this full screen. So the DNS search list option is what we're referring to here. It has two fields. It has a lifetime, which I use as a go time.duration, although I believe it's in seconds or something like that. 
Uh, and we also have the domain names. So you can append one or more domain names as your system search domains. So the, the encoding here, uh, for every domain name, we do a little bit of magic to kind of like take the DNS label pieces according to the algorithm in RFC 1035. We do any possible puny encoding or puny coding, which would actually handle things like Unicode. So you can have, for example, like fire emoji dot example dot com or stuff like that. Right. Uh, we pack the bytes together. We do a little bit of padding magic. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've looked at uh, no audio. Yes, join multi stream. <laughs> Yeah, thank you folks in chat. Uh, please keep sharing that link. Uh, this is, we're gonna do our best. This is what we came up with for today. Uh, in the future, we'll see if we can try something else. But uh, yeah, so looking at this, basically uh, given a lifetime and some DNS search lists, we pack them into the binary format. We return this option and there you go. Basically your system, if it knows how to recognize DNS options within uh, IPv6 router advertisements, it will recognize this option as well as the recursive DNS servers. So. I've already written this code. Um, Michael, if you have any questions or anything, I can try and go into it, but it's just been a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. Um, I think the the um, logical next step from my end would be to pull up the router seven source code, um, locate where we would need to make changes, um, try to put it in, see if a test already detects that anything has changed, um, and then adjust the, the golden output as necessary or add a new test. But I think we do have a test already for the router advertisement. Uh, I think you actually had that on your last stream when you worked on router seven as well. Yes, I did. Uh, so that would be under the integration RA DVD test. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So this test effectively, oh, I guess I'll let Michael talk through it because it's his test. <laughs> oh, no, it's cool. Um, why don't you try it? And I'll, I'll jump in if necessary. Um, <laughs> so we have a nice little validation that everything is understandable. Uh, yeah, sounds good. So basically what this is doing is it is setting up a new network namespace and creating a VETH pair. So you can think of a VETH pair as a virtual internet uh, internet, wow, Ethernet link. So you can think of it as a virtual wire with two points on each side. And you're actually able to bind services like clients and servers to each side and use them for sort of a, a local testing setup. This is also used with things like containers, which is pretty cool. Um, and I believe that one end of the VETH pair can be in a different namespace, which is why they're mostly used with containers. So what this effectively does is we are setting up a setting up some information within a certain network namespace. We are going to start the router seven router advertisement daemon and actually issue an advertisement and that would be in response to this rdisk6 command. So rdisk6, as well as ndisk6, are commands available in the ndisk6 package on Debian and Ubuntu. And basically, this is going to send a router solicitation, so indicating that an IPv6 speaking host would like access to the router advertisements uh, from any routers on the network. So when it sends this command, we will see this output come from our disk six. So this is kind of a cool integration test that Michael has written that will dump the entire output using a stable, well-known good tool. And we can basically add a new option here and check the output and see exactly what changed. Yep, that's exactly correct. And I assume that um, in your local network, you already have the option in there. So we could even do the our disk six on your machine. Yep. Um, and we should see the difference in output, right? Yeah, so I can, I can do, I don't actually know the syntax for that. So I actually created a little thing before I knew about this. I have my NDP RS. So you can see, for example, here, when I issue a router advertisement or solicitation on my own network, uh, we return a router advertisement with a variety of options set. We've got a couple of prefixes. We've got recursive DNS servers. And then here we have the DNS search list. So I have this lan.servner.com, a 20 minute lifetime. And that is the option we are going to add today. So I think if I ran like, what is it? R disk six uh, dash one dash I like that. I think without d-i. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So very similar output. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't realize this tool existed when I wrote my own. So <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> All right. Well, so, it's always nice to have uh, two tools for the same thing so that you can compare them against each other, you know, given that they're not too complicated. Mm -hmm. At some point it stops making sense, but here it's nice. Right. Exactly. So with all that being said, uh, I think we can go ahead and just give this a go. I guess, I don't know what, where if you have your, uh, what do you call it? If you have your configuration plumbed in from somewhere else, like I know how to add the option here, but I don't know how you actually configure this. So we can take a look at that. Right, yeah, why don't we take a look at it? You will find that most of the stuff is actually hard-coded. Uh, for example, the DNS search list, uh, I believe is hard-coded just to LAN for local area network. Um, at least for the, like in the DHCP for server, you should be able to see this. Okay, uh, one sec, DHCP. So you can, you can navigate either into the command slash DHCP 4D or directly into the internal DHCP 4. Yep, okay, so I'm in that package right now. Mm -hmm. Cool, 
Um, oh, by the way, uh, why don't you run a quick um, fetch or pull upstream um, so you get the changes that I pushed earlier today? Oh, well, you already have. Okay, That's, yeah, okay. as far as I can tell. Just making sure we're current. Yep. Okay, yeah, and then in the new handler, you see actually in line 105, uh, it, it is actually hard-coded <laughs> to the point that the option byte values are hard-coded. Nice. Um, because I was lazy at the time, right? Um, I just needed to get something to work. Um, and so the, the way that I typically develop all of these uh, networking things is you have some sort of golden output that you want to reach, and then you try and figure out like where all of the bits come from, right? And at the very first stage, you can just, like in some protocols, you can start by just capturing the bytes and then replaying them later, right? And the correct thing will happen. Then, of course, as soon as you have a protocol that has like a session, uh, a concept of a session, that no longer works, right? Because you need to have like uh, acknowledgement and responses that depend on the reply, et cetera. Um, but for the simple thing, like the simple approach is you just copy all of the bytes, right? And then you replace it step by step. Um, and you can see this here because this is not like fully replaced, right? This is not like code where every, every magic number and constant is already replaced. Um, but like I try to make a pragmatic trade-off uh, where I stop uh, caring, so to say, for the relevant stage of the project. And this is like a perfectly fine evolution of the project here, right? Uh, so we have a thing that is currently hard-coded. We can make it a little bit nicer when we touch the feature the next time, which is now, right? Because we want the uh, domain name uh, to be not only um, put out by the DHCP4 server, but also by the router advertisement daemon. So now would be a good time to both clean up the current hard-coding that we have in there and also to uh, have a canonical single source of truth for this value, right? Because currently it's just LAN and it lives in two packages If once we're done with uh, the task that we're about to do. Um, so that's not good. We want a, a central definition of it so that if we change it, we only need to change it in one, one, uh, in one place. Mm -hmm. So how do we want to do this? Would we like to try the VS Code live share again? Or what would you prefer? Um, yeah, yeah, we can try this. Okay. Um, Let's give that a go. Uh... So we got this working the other day. Uh, hopefully with any luck, it will, okay. What is this email? Invite by email. Yeah, I don't really want to send you an email though because it's not really going to help. <laughs> um, why don't you just start your collaboration session? I'll see if it magically right. appears here because we've already been in contact recently. Yes, uh, I've got the link copied. I can send it to our chat if that is helpful. Yep. Uh, VS Code Live Share is pretty good. Doesn't GitHub work? GitHub, as in like the GitHub username? Uh, I guess I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, but yes, VS Code Live Share is pretty good. It, it doesn't do like live collaboration on sc on stream, right? Uh, GitHub or did that work? Let's see here. Next one, I think this is how this worked, right? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Sure. Yes, so VS Code Live Share does work with GitHub users. That's actually how we've done the authentication here. So I, I had previously logged into it, and Michael had previously logged into it as well. And with any luck, we will have a shared session up shortly where we can basically do Google Docs for coding, kind of, which is very cool. So. OK, that's very interesting what's happening here. But uh, we'll <laughs> see this actually results in a shared workspace. Uh... Uh, if any folks have any questions, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat. So we are reading both chats. We will try our best to pay attention and answer questions. Uh, that being said, since we're talking to each other, things are going to be a little bit different today. We might not get to your question immediately, but we will do our best. Oh, I think I'll need to like sign in again. <laughs> do you want to do your uh, password hiding input and stuff? Or I don't think it's strictly necessary. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, this looks better. Now I see you. <laughs> yep, okay. I can click invite contact. I'm not sure what that would do, maybe. Uh, do you need to like acknowledge me joining now? Uh, I don't think I've seen a notification for that yet, unfortunately, but I can try and invite you and see what happens. There we go. Oh, wait. Oh yeah, it says sign in again. I'm gonna do the sign in again. <laughs> Just like uh, you know, your your corporate two factor auth system. Just every time you have something to do, you have to do the two factor. Join the collaboration okay, session. Excellent. Better. There we go. So now, if you make some changes to this uh, handler, for example, I should be able to see it. I believe. Move all of this out of the way. <laughs> oh God. 
All right, this was messy to set up, but now we're here. <laughs> yep. So I can see uh, I can see my cursor on your screen at least. So I think if you make changes yeah. now, they should appear on my screen as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, getting back to the actual content, um, I think the the like the okay. So the the way I try to arrange my milestones is that so we immediately have like a little win and can see something change, right? Um, and uh, we can work in like little increments. So I think the the easiest bit would be to introduce a new option that we send out in the router advertisement daemon and then just rerun the test and see that it actually complains. That would be like my first step. Yep, sounds great to me. So in that case, if you wanna hop over to uh, redvd.go where I believe you can follow me if you're not already. Um, let's yeah, see here. I have it here. So is this going to be, this is always gonna be present in all of your RAs, right? So this is not going to be like an optional thing. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So I guess probably what I would do in this case is we have this slice of options here we're adding. So I believe if I start typing here, there we go. So the API in my package is NDP DNS search list. And this takes a lifetime, which I think you actually have to specify. So for now, we'll just do what I have on my machine or my default. So a time of 20 minutes. Well, I mean, we already have the prefix information scoped to a lifetime of two hours, right? Um, oh, okay. No, wait, preferred is 20, no, 30 minutes actually. Um, should these be equal or like, is there a reason why this would be different? So I guess I can't remember. I am using a lot of the defaults in Core Red and I inherited a lot of those from RE-DVD. So I, uh, I, can, I can check really quick. Um, so my prefixes are preferred for four hours and my DNS lifetimes are both 20 minutes. So I believe those are values I inherited from RE-DVD. Okay, so have a look at this. Um, the RFC actually specifies the lifetime value has the same semantics as with the RDNSS option, so it should check that as well. Mm -hmm. That is, lifetime should be bounded as follows. The maximum router advertisement interval should be less than the lifetime, which should be less than twice the max router advertisement interval. I think the router advertisement interval is actually not present in the RAs. I think that's an internal parameter. And in my code, I know I think it's like 10 minutes by default. So that's probably why it's that way. Uh, I don't know what you have your interval set as in here. Yeah, we'll need to look this up. Yep. yep. Uh, one minute, it appears. Oh yeah, that, that might be true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, my, my general approach is to like, uh, be very aggressive in, in many things um, if they're scoped to like your local home network. Um, a, a different example of where I have this strategy. Um, oh, and by the way, we should clean up that to-do on screen here, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. Uh, <laughs> Um, another uh, area of Router 7 where I have the strategy is in the DHCP v4 client. Now, keep in mind, this is this is not like the DHCP uh, v4 that you run on your local network. This is the DHCP that you run with your ISP so that you get a public IP address for accessing the internet. And on that particular path, um, what I'm doing is uh, I'm keeping the DHCP leases that I get uh, even once they're invalid. Like, I don't ever expire them, right? Um, because I know that my ISP has protect protection against this misconfiguration um, on their end, like in their in their hardware. Um, and the best that can happen is that they have like a transient DHCP server outage, or maybe you know DHCP server is unreachable or is rebooting or whatever. Um, and I keep my lease, I don't expire it, and I keep my connectivity as well. Or the DHCP server is actually only unreachable for me, and on their end, their access control reconfigures everything so that I can't cause any damage anyway. Right, so they need to be prepared for customers doing stupid things anyway. So we might as well do that, um, and you know that way improve reliability. So the 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 maximum of router seven is to be up for as long and as much as possible under any circumstances. Excellent. So do you want to do the do we want to look into this error handling or should we look into the uh, search list for now or uh, let's do the search list first and then maybe yep. jump back to the error handling here if that's a quick thing that we can add. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Uh, you just got to give something to my channel, by the way. So <laughs> not that I plan to run ads or anything, but I will hopefully have some emotes fairly soon. Hey, yeah. welcome. Thanks for hanging out. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So for a lifetime. I guess what what lifetime do you think is appropriate here, right? I mean, uh, since you've got a one minute interval, um, thinking about the RFC again. Yeah, so I'm thinking this might be one of the things where um, it might be better to start with like the 20 minute lifetime yep. um, that you have and that works for you. And that will certainly also work here, right? Because yes. 
Uh, the only violation that I can see here is that, you know, some client might be super aggressively strict in interpreting the RFC and might, I don't know, you know, refresh this more aggressively or complain in a log message or something like that, but it's not going to be a catastrophic failure. But um, of course, for cleanliness, we should actually do like a full audit, probably of all of the type lifetime values that we have here and verify that all of the conditions that are in the RFC actually hold. Mm -hmm. And ideally, we would also express these conditions in the, in the relations uh, in code, right? So we would say that, you know, if there is a relationship between the 20 minutes here and let's say the 30 minutes that we have in the preferred lifetime of the router advertisement prefixes, um, then that should be enforced by the code. But we don't have that right now, right? Everything is hard coded right now. So why don't we hard code this and then leave a to do here saying, um, you know, we should audit all of these lifetimes um, and express them in relation of each other where necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I, I remember having to go through, you know, come through RFC 4861 and like figure out all these different relationships. Like everything is kind of based off of that max uh, router advertisement interval. So you yeah. can adjust things depending on what that value is. Um, but of course, I also inherited a lot of defaults from REDVD because I think some of the RFC defaults were like very, very long. Like a prefix is, a prefix is considered valid for like seven days, which seems uh, quite a lot for a home environment. So, yeah. Yeah, I had this discussion actually earlier today um, where uh, I, I posted that I added this quirk. Like, um, actually, let me let me show you here on screen. Mm -hmm. um, so the latest commit that we have in router 7 is uh, that Nintendo devices have a minimum lease time now of one hour. Um, the lease time that I'm using in my home network is actually the other extreme. Like you mentioned, seven days is like the maximum time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, but I'm using 20 minutes as like the, the standard lease time that I have for the DHCP leases. Um, and uh, this has the advantage that I can like tie my home automation um, to devices being active in the network. And active in this case means that they have actually extended their DHCP lease before it expires. Um, so it's kind of like the DHCP server exports which devices it thinks are active. Um, and in order for that to work well, like in order for that to, for example, trigger, um, let's say, a light uh, going off once the last mobile phone leaves our apartment, um, this needs to be somewhat quick, right? Um, so if we have like a, a, a least lifetime of a day, um, we could only observe a state change every half a day. Um, so that's why I crank it down all the way to like 20 minutes. Um, but there are devices which violate this actually. Um, probably because they test in scenarios where everything is a little bit more standard, I want to say. Like they just tested in a couple of homes that all had like, you know, a, a router that gave out one hour leases or something or or even longer leases than that. Um, and yeah, the, the Nintendo Switch, what it does is uh, once it has the address, it will just enter sleep mode, uh, power saving mode, and then it just holds on to the address while it is in power saving mode, even if the minimum power saving duration that it has uh, exceeds the expiration time. So maybe they just didn't check for that condition or they didn't care. Um, so yeah, effectively this resulted in a MacBook not being able to come onto the network um, because it was using, it was getting assigned the IP address that the DHCP server thought was already released, but the Nintendo Switch still had it. Um, so now I just have like this um, MAC address filter in here and uh, the all of the Nintendo MAC address prefixes, which are actually quite a number. Um, and whenever, like, the, so this is so that I can keep the lease time at the 20 minutes, um, and only the Nintendo devices will have the higher lease time. So I consider this a quirk. Um, we'll see how long uh, I can uphold this um, until the point when I eventually switch to, like, one hour leases or something, if there's too much incompatibility that I observe in the wild. But this is the first one that I've seen so far. That's pretty wild, actually. So I actually have a, I have a switch as well, but I think I'm using the... Uh, ISC DHCP defaults, which I think is probably one day at the moment. I would like to switch to uh, something else, something Go, you know, memory safe, etc. There is the core DHCP project, which is pretty cool. Uh, that is being worked on by a couple of folks who have done a lot of DHCP things in Go. So here's hoping, you know. Uh, but that being said, maybe I could tear out or maybe parts of the uh, the router 7 DHCP daemon could be useful for me as well, which would be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty minimal. Um, you're going to see <laughs> um, if we're going to work on one of the other items uh, that I have uh listed in the label. Um, but yeah, why don't we actually go back and actually get the search list in there? Of course, yeah. Uh, one sec, got a couple things in the chat. Uh, had to buy a new router years ago because both the router and my ISP were being strict in V6 RAs with two different interpretations of a single sentence. Yikes, that's, uh, that's no fun. 
Yeah, um, there is the, the saying or the motto that uh, you should be strict in what you send out and liberal in what you accept uh, whenever you deal with RFCs. And I think that's a good approach. And, you know, if both of the parties would have used it in your scenario, then uh, you wouldn't have had to buy a new router. Mm -hmm. uh, apologies. Okay, so now we have the lifetime set here. We need to set the domain names. In your case, you just have the land suffix, right? So you don't actually have a... You don't actually have like a internal dot uh, whatever Stoffelberg dot de or anything. You just have. Yep, that's correct. Okay, it's yeah. just um, It's okay. short. It's the point. It is usually free. Like it doesn't overlap with any of the TLDs, I believe. Um, I think it is considered actually local, um, as per like one RFC, or if it's not local, it's at least marked so that it will never be like given out as a GTLD. Um, and there are other names that distinctly you cannot use in a domain setting. I believe I used localhost as the domain name for like a while, um, which, you know, it seemed nice because it is like RFC spec to be one of these host names that you can never like leave uh, your local network in terms of, you know, scoping things. Um, but also it turns out that actually I think system D, network D or something interprets it in, in a certain way. And it would always resolve. Oh yeah, I think once you use system to resolve D, it would always resolve everything to localhost underneath these domains. So that obviously wouldn't work um, anymore. And that I think was the point when I noticed. Oh yeah, I should, probably shouldn't abuse domains like that. I should pick something that is distinct yet will not be used or shadow anything. Certainly. So what I think is interesting is you know with the advent of the .dev domain recently, there were lots and lots of people using you know something my site my website .dev. And now suddenly that's a, a GTLD. So I've actually adopted the approach of I have the domain name. I have a domain name registered and I have land dot that domain name as my uh, internal yeah. DNS search. But I can understand that why. Approach, yeah. Sure. Um, I used to run the same thing for a while, but I think um, for the router seven specifically, it is better if it has something that is not tied to any specific person or domain, right? Um, so if this is .lan, it will work for all of the people who install router seven. Not that I think uh, it will be many people, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it's better if it's generic enough. Uh, in the chat, um, MXF is asking, you said localhost. Did you mean to say local domain? I did not. And no, it was actually dot localhost, um, which I thought was a clever hack because I think it enabled something. But then, yeah, it broke catastrophically. So it was not a clever hack after all. <laughs> so I think that with just this change, uh, we will be at the point where we can go ahead and run the tests again. So it's been, a, it's been a little bit since I've run these. Is there just make test? Is that what it was? Yeah. Okay, so if we run the test now, I imagine what we will see is the rdisk6 command will run. We will see a slightly different output because now we are adding an additional uh, NDP option, and as a result, the test should fail. So with any luck, that will mean this is all you know going according to plan. So let's see what happens. Oh, pseudo, huh? You're gonna you're gonna wreck my machine. <laughs> I'm kidding. For sure. Right, here we go. Yep. All my development setups uh, set yeah. up so that they uh, destroy my machine. Thrashing, thrashing my hard drive right now or my uh, SSD. <laughs> now okay. I'm gonna pull a an Nvidia or Steam on you. Yeah. Right. Today. Uh oh shoot! I don't have Biobu open, do I? Okay. Oh, I guess I'll have to do that. But where is it? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. See, so check it. So. We will actually notice here that the rdisk6 command now sees this DNS search list option as missing. So this did exactly what we intended. So now we are advertising a DNS search list with a lifetime of 1200 seconds and we're good to go. Um, I think one, one thing you could try um, is, I think there's a fail fast option that was added to go test a while ago. Really? Um, if you run make test again, I think um, now that I've changed it in the make file, which you know, I hope that is effective on your checkout. I suspect it would be. Yes. Did, yeah, you, did you save the um, file? Yeah. Why don't you give it a try and see if it fails with like the message that we care about at the very end of the output now? Sounds good. Hmm. Nah, didn't didn't okay. seem to, but looks like no. Don't know for sure why that is. Yeah, I don't know either. That that option is new to me. Um, cool. Well, so this, uh, this appeared to work at least, so we can just go ahead and actually copy and paste this into the test, which is kind of nice. So, uh... Wait, did I maybe not have this saved? Um, oh, maybe, yeah. Uh... So I don't see anything changed in my file system here. Yeah. Okay, now it's know. changed. 
Oh yeah, let's try it now and see if that was yep. my mistake. So I have my Emacs set up so that whenever I do a compile, it saves all of the files. So I never consciously save anything <laughs> and that just bit me now. Yeah, totally. I tend to just, uh, still doesn't look oh, like it worked, okay. unfortunately, but. Yep, okay, well, fair thing. enough. Um, yep. One thing that um, I'm in the habit of is that, um, you know, whenever I'm working on a specific test, um, whoops, I will make it so that I just run this particular one test. Uh, so this would be integration router advertisement, I think. Yep. Uh, can you give that a shot? Just trying to make tests again. Uh, yep. Let me check the uh, diff. Uh, yeah, looks good. Yeah. Yeah, I usually do the same. I don't tend to have make files except for things like linker flags. I tend to just go test manually, but oh, there we go. Yeah, nice. Cool. Looks good. Yeah, so in router 7, you should also be able to run go test manually for most of the tests. But this particular one, because it is an integration test and it needs to spin up these virtual Ethernet pair devices, uh, it needs elevated privileges. So it's right. not so convenient to just run uh, go test directly here. Right, right. Good point. Uh, I'm going to try and fix my terminal one sec on my end. Sure. Make sure. Okay, there we go. I'm not used to running without my uh, Biobu slash Tmux setup, so I didn't have like scrolling that worked. <laughs> so, okay, there we go. So now we're at the point where we can go ahead and add those lines to the test. So if we go to, oh, integration, RA DVD, RA DVD test, and I already don't remember which part of the uh, <laughs> output it was changed, so I guess we'll run it again, you know. This is one of the cool things about Go is the tests are pretty fast, you know, even spinning up things like uh, Ethernet pairs here. Oh, got to do the credentials thing again, no problem. Okay, right, so just before the MTU. So if I do this, oh no, oh gosh. Uh, I copied and pasted some formatting. I'm pretty sure, is that actually indented? No, yes. Oh, so this is, this would be outdented. This would be here, and then this would be here, I believe. I think that's roughly the right output, except for this has to be, okay. Oh, sorry. Go test will tell us. It will, yes. Uh, I'm going to try and align this and just pretend like I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> ah. Okay. So with any luck now, that comma needs to go away too. With any luck, this is approximately the correct text, fish, text uh, fixture. Uh, hello, was the microphone intentionally turned off? Yes. Uh, go to, shoot. Folks in Stoffelberg's chat, please go to the multi-stream. Multi-stream. For audio. Actually, I have this little uh, layout here where the multi-stream is now on my screen. Oh, excellent. Um, okay. So let's see if that will nudge people along. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so this failed due to what looks like white space. Fun. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think this is because you aligned it here, right? Like. Oh, this yeah. I guess I would have assumed it would be lined up that way. It, it looks like this might actually be a bug in the artist tool, though, right? Yeah, because I would expect it to be lined up. Uh, I would expect or, it to be justified with everything else. No, actually, no, it's not a bug, right? Because these are lined up here consistently. Like, if you look at the level of indentation, you can see that, like, the sub items are indented with an additional tab, it looks like, right? But the rest is at the beginning of the line. I see. But in that case, it's weird because the MTU is also a top level option and it is not indented. So, or, or, yeah, it's not uh, oh, indented yeah, that way. True. That is true. Yeah, it is inconsistent, uh, or it seems like. So let's try this. I expected this would work, assuming we got our white space roughly right. Uh, oh, there's a trailing space. Is that what that is? Oh, yeah. Or it wants a trailing space. Is that really the case? <laughs> oh my God. Really? My editor might actually strip that, so OK. OK, so now I'm a little bit curious, though. Um, yeah. Is it that we are sending a trailing white space in the option as well? So I think it's null terminated. So I'm pretty sure my code will null terminate this for me. So let me jump to the thing here. Um, yes, each domain name is null terminated. I believe that is part of the RFC. So I guess if I run rdisk6 uh, RDisk on my own network, I would be curious if it did the same thing. I suspect it would, but... Oh, of course I can't oh, tell. Make but... it visible somehow. Uh, is there a quick way to do that in the terminal? I don't actually know. Yeah, you can. Well, so one like uh, very coarse-grained way is to just pipe it through hexdump or HD. 
Yeah, so if we did if we did hex dump, it'd be uh, there we go. Um, yeah. Let's see here. So DNS search list. That's a uh, twenty. Yeah, it has a white space after it. Wild. Okay. Um, that seems strange because I mean this has been working for me for months, so I suspect this is just a, a weird thing with the tool, maybe. Yeah. Um, huh. Okay. Thing, like okay, while you while you continue with uh, actually sending this as a pull request, why don't I have yep. a quick look here? I think it's in the Endisk package. Yeah, it's Endisk six, or maybe the package is called Rdisk six. I don't exactly remember. Uh, okay, test pass. So I'll go ahead and issue that pull request. Uh, I'm gonna have to log into GitHub. So things are things are a little crazy today. We uh, right before the stream, we were having an issue where my Chrome was crashing every time I tried to share my screen. So that was uh, very fun. So give me just a moment here. I'm gonna fix my GitHub auth and everything, and then we will send our first pull request of the day. Very cool. Oh yeah, see, that's so strange. Like, why would they? Why would they want that? I wonder. Yeah, I don't know for sure. Um, it it seems like an oversight. It is at least uh, slightly misleading. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, at least now we know it's intentional. Right. Okay, so we're back over here. Uh, I've got GitHub up and running. So let's go back to here. And let's issue a pull request. Sweet. Yeah, that. You know, it's so funny. the uh, the red The red highlight here in the diff makes me uh, makes me sad, right? But <laughs> uh, is it because they're trying to join the list? Oh yeah, probably. Yeah, if you if you look at this, this loop goes to option length, and mm -hmm. then this is just one domain each. And yeah, that that's how they're joining the list. I see. Okay. Uh, we yep. should make a new branch. So. DNS SL. So it's always kind of funny because these are abbreviated as RDNSS for recursive DNS servers, as well as DNS SL for DNS search list. So sometimes I tend to refer to them that way and just totally forget what the actual like meaning is, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, someone in your chat mentions uh, still adding the separator to the last item. Strings joined to the rescue. Yes, totally. Uh, I am glad I never really have to do string manipulation in C because from what I remember writing a shell in school, it was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so, Sure. Yeah, the Go uh, standard library is way easier. Support for DNS SL. Uh, yep. Let's do fork head. Okay. All right. Router 7. How convenient that uh, Filippo started and gave me a nice little link. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is DNS search list of LAN with a lifetime of 1,200 seconds, and that is that. Um, actually, did we add the to-do that we wanted to add? No, we did not. We can do that. Yeah. So you want a to-do here for the hard coding or the lifetime or both? Both, actually, yeah. Um, why don't I actually add these in here? Go for it. Um, uh, so really quick in the chat, started having the same issue with Chrome with sharing my screen since last week. Yeah, exactly. So the Chrome from two weeks ago works just fine. So I actually installed the older Debian package so we can share on a video call locally and be more in sync. So I have no idea what the issue is, but Chrome on AMD 64, uh, all kinds of fun, right? So thanks, Michael, for uh, saving me today before the stream. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, that text looks good to me. Cool. Are you ready for me to commit this? Yes. Okay. Should we do the uh, what's I don't know what the tag is like the co-authored by or something? Do you do you care about anything like that? Eh, I don't care. Okay. Internal. That's and, what I really like about the Linux ecosystem: find the bugs and the patch and fix it. Yes, you're correct. Yeah, totally. Like it, it's so strange that that would be the case. Like I never would have even imagined that tool had a the trailing space. You know, it's trailing spaces tend to lead me to think that there's some bug somewhere, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in this case, it's just an imperfection. Like, I can see why they did it this way, but... Totally. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things you could just check for, like, the loop counter. Like, if len equals zero or if len equals one, skip it. But no big deal. But it's an extra line, man. Yeah. Yeah, right. You gotta, can't, uh, can't have any extra lines in your output, right? Uh -huh. uh, hello, Twitch chat. Uh, hey, what keyboard do you use? So as it turns out, Michael and I both actually use Kinesis Advantages. So I have the Kinesis Advantage 2. I believe he has a very cool, heavily modified Kinesis Advantage 1. So he can talk about that. Yeah. Um, let me actually, I've never actually opened my website on this profile. Uh, let me pull this up. So sure. I have this brand new blog post where um, you can learn all about my setup. 
Um, the keyboard specifically is a Kinesis Advantage, as Matt mentioned. Um, this is an older revision, but uh, yeah, the, the features that I care about are just as good. Um, I have it heavily modified. I started modifying this uh, because I wasn't happy with the kind of key switches that were in there. Um, they come with the brown Cherry MX key switches. I prefer the blue ones, just a matter of taste. Um, so I actually uh, contacted them, and they gracefully sent me all of the PCBs um, so I could solder in my own switches, which was very nice of them. Um, and that got me started on doing more modifications on it. So I have uh, a custom controller originally to work around the bug. Now I have a custom controller, which has a very, very low input latency. Um, you can read all about it in the various blog posts that I have. Yeah, that's super cool. So I'm still running a stock Kinesis Advantage 2, but he's made me quite jealous. So for example, mine does not have a USB hub, which is really annoying. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so, we both wrote blogs about our posts recently, so I'll, I'll share that as well. Oh, yeah, so cool. uh, thanks, Flo, for uh, sharing that as well. But uh, cool. So the pull request is up, and the CI is running. Yep. Yeah. So I think the only other NDP option you could add now, if you really wanted to, would be routes. So I don't actually run any route options on my network, but we do support them. I think uh, this doesn't make sense in my scenario because the only route that I have is what the default route behavior already adds, right? Yep. It already adds the router from which it gets the router advertisement, I think. Yep. I'm in the same boat, but I actually have been considering setting up like a lab with a separate router because I have my old Ubiquiti gear that I'm not using anymore. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so now it's in the stage where it's setting up a Docker container to have like a reproducible environment. Um, and run the tests in so that this is independent of whichever base image Travis has. Um, this takes a little while. Um, <laughs> That's pretty cool. Travis is slow and because Debian is slow, um, mm -hmm. I have recently benchmarked uh, this tree in a comparable scenario and it could actually achieve much, much higher data rates for installing these packages, even on Travis and much more so on GitHub Actions, which is generally a lot faster than Travis. Mm -hmm. So my resolution is to migrate everything off of Travis and onto GitHub Actions. Yeah, actions are really great. I think the only thing I would be missing is I am currently using Source Hut builds, and Source Hut is nice because I can also do uh, FreeBSD and OpenBSD, which I actually use in the WireGuard Control Go project because that gives me the ability to test the user space interface and then uh, the kernel interface for OpenBSD whenever that's merged. So that's going to be very cool. Yep, for cross platform, that's definitely valuable. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we're going to approve this. Going to do a squash and merge. Uh, yeah. And it is in. Wonderful. Nice. Oh, one thing that we actually forgot, and only now, of course, um, I noticed this, <laughs> is uh, to, to mention this issue that we just ah, fixed yep. in the commit. Um, but it's no problem. We can just go here. Um, we can just uh, copy the commit ID here and say fixed with commit, and then this whole thing, you can say close and comment. Um, it actually links this now and mm -hmm. references it. This is not entirely as nice as the uh, if you reference the issue, but it's good enough. Yeah, totally. And it's nice that it shortens the hash into less of a, uh, a monstrosity, you know? Yeah, for sure. Very cool. Cool. So okay. this, was the, uh, this was the easy issue for today. So now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, this was the warm-up um, so that we could all... You know, talk a little bit about the project, um, and you'll see how the contribution process works. Mm -hmm. um, we run the tests, our, our setup is good, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Um, so let's see, what, what else do we have? Um, so one thing that I added very recently, just this morning, is native DNS support. Um, I'm just going to explain all three of them, and then we're going to talk more about which one we want to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, so for DIN DNS, um, the, uh, the, the situation is that the IPv4 address that I get from my ISP is not static. Um, I could pay more money to get one, but I don't want to support IPv4 like that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I just have like a, a DNS record that points to my current IPv4 address, and that's good enough. And it changes rarely, right? Because as long as my router is online, it has the same address. But so effectively, like I don't know, maybe you know, once a year or once once per half a year or so, it changes. Um, so I want it automated, um, and I have like a little program that just uh, checks the Cloudflare DNS record that I have checks if it matches the public IPv4 address of the uplink interface, um, and if not, it updates it. Um, I have recently seen that, I believe it was Matt Holt who um, 
uh, published th this set of libraries here, which is uh, called libdns. Um, yeah, uh, mhold. Um, it has this disclaimer here. It says it's a work in progress. Export APIs are subject to change. So, eh, okay. But I mean, we're in module mode, so we could give a shot and see how much the maintenance effort actually is in practice. Um, or, you know, keep it as an optional, uh, optional part of the project for now. Mm -hmm. But um, what this does is um, it has these other packages here, for example, for Cloudflare, for Gandhi, Route 53, um, TransIP, which I haven't heard of. But uh, presumably, it's pretty easy to like, you know, fulfill these interfaces and publish your own package that you can then use here. So instead of um, like, so this is a nice building block for a DIN DNS feature, right? Because instead of having to implement all of these various providers for ourselves, we could just use this and then very easily get like a reasonably configurable DIN DNS support. Um, the, the actual code that we need for this is very little. Um, I have it already written. This is mostly like, you know, introducing a new control surface for it, um, using these libraries, et cetera. It might be nice, not too much work, I don't think. Um, then this one here is an interesting one. So this uh, ties back to the incident that I mentioned earlier, where I was telling you about the quirk um, that I added for the Nintendo devices, which uh, wouldn't respect the lease lifetime correctly. So this was the same incident. Um, and the only reason why I noticed that the Nintendo devices do violate the spec like that uh, is that Apple actually has a DHCP client, which uh, whenever the operating system detects that there is an IP address conflict on the network, um, the DHCP client will actually send a DHCP decline request to the server, um, telling it that it doesn't want the lease that it has gotten because you know, obviously the IP address cannot actually be used. Um, and then it hopes that the server will actually give it a different IP address on the next iteration, and then will try to rejoin the network a couple of times. Um, so this is pretty nice in terms of user experience because in most of the networks, um, I imagine that this actually helps, right? Um, so the reason this didn't work um, and the reason why I did actually look into this whole issue to begin with um, is because uh, we're currently using ramp.intn to get like a random number when we decide on which IP address of the pool to hand out. So that's actually okay. So we would have expected that, you know, uh, once the DHCP client on the MacBook um, sent the DHCP decline and asks again, it should get a different IP address. But this was not the case because there's another code path here where uh, it looks at the leases that were previously in the database. And if there is any lease for the hardware address that is asking, even if it is expired, um, it will try to reuse that lease. Um, so in this case, the scenario was as follows. We had the MacBook using, let's say, IP address 4. Then we had the MacBook drop off the network. We had the switch come in. Switch gets the IP address 4 by chance, which is now available though, right? Um, the switch holds onto it, the MacBook comes back, the DHCP server says, well, the switch uh, is in power safe, but the IP address has expired, so you might as well have it. Um, and then the MacBook is like, oh no, there's an IP address conflict, it gives it back, but it will always get the same IP address again. So what we'll need to change here is um, at least one thing, uh, which is um, when there is a DHCP decline that the client sends, we currently don't handle that at all, because it's not strictly required. It's something that happens very, very rarely. Um, but we should add a handler for it. And then uh, we should delete the previous leases uh, for the MAC address that sent us the DHCP decline um, if, they're, you know, if they can be expired, actually. Um, so this should not be an attack vector, but um, this should be like a convenience thing or a reliability thing, rather, um, where if you send a DHCP decline, you actually will get a different IP address afterwards. Um, another little thing that we can change here is that um, currently we just do like the random, but um, a nice little addition would be to actually hash the hardware address in a way um, so that you sort of get um, persistency without actually having to store any persistent state. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of like adds a little bit of uh, determinism into how the IP addresses are chosen. I'm not entirely sure if that's better or worse than just randomly assigning them. DNS mask does it with the hashing. I think it might be worth a shot to do the hashing. Uh, with a little twist, which is that uh, once we have the DHCP decline, it should actually change like the, the seed that it uses for hashing so that it like reshuffles the IP addresses. Um, at which point, maybe there's not so much point anymore in having the, the persistency. So uh, hard to tell. But you know, we can debate about the nuances if we decide to actually embark on this. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third um, ticket that I have in here is uh, to optionally block incoming IPv6 connections, except for explicitly allowed IPs. Um, the current scenario is that, um, uh, at least on the on the uh, internet connection that I have, um, I'm online and I have public IPv6 addresses. And uh, if you wanted to reach like my laptop directly via the internet, you could. Um, 
this is like for some people this is like the ideal setup right um, if you know what you're doing if you have tight control over your machines and firewalls if you're confident enough that everything is secured this is good um, otherwise uh, like for consumers maybe it's a little bit friendlier um, to have like a setup where you block by default um, i think the uh, flitzbox routers which are very popular in germany um, they do this by default where uh, incoming ipv6 is uh, blocked by default and you need to explicitly whitelist it um, this should be an optional feature, um, but I think it's a good feature to have. Um, and I've already prototyped how we would do it in NF tables. Um, so if we were to use like the NFT command line tool, this is how we could do it. Uh, so we just need to like translate that into Go code essentially, but it might be that some of the nuances here might not already, might not be expressible in Go code yet. Um, so maybe we need to add like a little feature here or there to the NF tables library. Um, this could be, I think this is the most involved of the three things that we have in our list. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the three ones to recap, um, native to the NS support, um, then the DHCP decline. I think the DHCP decline is the simplest actually, like my preference would be to start with that. And then we have the blocking IPv6 connections, or if there's any suggestions from either you or the stream, um, I'm all ears for that. Yeah, totally. I think the DHCP decline seems reasonable to me. Uh, the... Hmm, yeah, the V6 thing, the NF tables thing would definitely be complicated. And as for the as for the DIN DNS, um, that's something I would be interested in as well, actually. So if we could potentially split something out in that way, that would be nice. But I think the DHCP thing is probably the, the prudent option at the moment. Yeah, cool. Um, then why don't we start with this one? Sure. So this would be DHCP 4D, correct? Correct. This is using my uh, my packet sockets package, which is pretty cool, sending Ethernet frames. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for some reason, it's not following you, I think. Oh, really? Um... Oh, maybe it was just like idle. Yeah, no, it, this is weird. Like, not... As soon as I pulled up the uh, share tab here, it actually synchronized. Oh, OK. Yeah. So what was the uh, the randomization logic you were looking at? Uh, so, uh, that's line one by two. Okay. Uh, question in the chat. Does it check if the IP is unused with ARP ping? It does not. Does not at the moment. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing that we could do um, if we wanted to be extra fail safe. Um, I have a ping package, um, which, you know, we could use. I don't know. Um, I would like to like solve it on this level first because it's all like you know we can solve it at this level without introducing new behaviors. Um, so I would prefer this for the moment. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So the idea here would be we need to receive the DHCP decline and then modify the seed accordingly. So I guess, would you like to break this into the two steps where first we do the hashing like DNS mask or would you prefer just to skip that today and just try again, perhaps on decline? Um, yeah, so what I would do first is the decline handler. Yep. Um, actually, what I would really do first is the test, right? Um, yep. Because currently it should be possible to like write a test which uh, essentially walks us through this scenario again. Like uh, this, is the, this is necessary so that we can actually encode uh, our understanding of the bug um, and verify that everything that I've explained so far is actually correct, right? Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Hmm. So I'm taking a look at your tests here within this package. Is this is this not an integration test, or would this be a? This is the internal test. So this is not an integration test actually. This okay. just does the surf DHCP and verifies that the uh, response packets that are generated um, match certain properties, right? Like it directly inspects the packets without ever sending them onto any network link. I see. Okay. So, yeah, so this... these you can directly run in your VS code. Like if you do a run test on yep. the test preferred address, that should work. It does. Excellent. Nice. So these are quick to iterate on also, right? Yep. So would this be would this be where we want to add a new subtest here, essentially? Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Probably at the very end of the file. Yep. Uh... Oh, wait. Subtest. Um, do we mean subtest? Like which test is this that you're modifying? Oh, sorry, uh, the preferred address, because this looks like the client is requesting an address, and perhaps this is not the appropriate test added to. Um, in this case, actually, I think we should, uh, so I think we should start a separate test function entirely. Yep. Um, also mention the bug in there, right? So that, like, you know, nobody ever accidentally, um, after the fact, goes there and refactors the test to do something subtly different. Um, so, you know, I won't make it clear that it's like replaying an exact scenario of a bug. 
And I think in this case, it was actually like the client was not actually requesting any IP address, right? Like the client intentionally, like it was in the client's interest to get a new IP address that it didn't have before. So it would not request a specific IP address. So that would not be a correct test function. Mm. Right, okay, because by request, you mean like they're requesting a specific address, not like a DHCP request in general or like a DHCP discover. Yeah, or no, so request is actually a packet between type. Between the discover and the request, right? So the yeah. discover is potentially open and then the request you would say, oh yeah, the IP address that you've just offered me I want to request that. Right, right. Yeah, I worked on DHCP about, I think it's been about a year and a half, so I'm a little rusty, but. Hmm. Yeah. So do you want to add this to the end of the file perhaps? Yep. So it looks like we roughly want this test handler code as well, because this is going to spin up your internal uh, exactly. infrastructure. Uh, yep. Let's see here. Uh, so perhaps test client to client, right? Yep. Uh, okay. So now we want to take a look at the request handling code. So serve DHCP, I assume. So now we have, so you're handling discovers, you're handling requests and that's it. So yep. do you want to, so, uh, the, the way I would start for this test is to not actually look at the handler yet, right? Because we know the handler works uh, for all of the parts that we need to get done until we can actually have the test fail the first time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the way I would start is I would go back to the test function and write a couple of to-dos that roughly outline the milestones that we want to reach in this test, right? Right. Let me pull up right. the GitHub issue in another browser really quick, just so I can take yeah. a look. Um, okay, so I'm just going to walk through this again and write a couple of to-dos as I speak, right? Yeah, please do. So initially, uh, we have nothing, right? We don't have any leases. So we have like the MacBook requests a new lease, right? Um, we're going to go into more detail on all of these to-dos as we go, but this is just very high level. Um, so then we have the MacBook lease expires, right? Then we have the switch requests a new lease um, and gets the same address actually. So here, we would want um, request same IP address that MacBook had. This is not what happened in reality, but this is what we need to make the test behave the same way mm -hmm. um, and deterministically. Because in reality, we just had like the random uh, function spit out the same IP address. Um, so then the switch requests a new lease, uh, switch lease expires, MacBook comes back. Um, and then we want to verify gets a different IP address after decline, after a DHCP decline. Um, so here, the expectation is that we will offer the same address, right? Um, even though the MacBook doesn't, well, it would actually ask for the same IP address initially, but we want, so, okay, so we also want this in a loop. Um, with at least two iterations um, so that we like initially it will ask for the same ip address then it will uh, get it it will verif it will say oh yeah i can't use it and then it will send a decline and then the next time it will not ask for a specific address again um, but our server right now will still return a specific address mm -hmm. um, and then the the test case here is that uh, essentially invert the the expectation right so to make the test pass um, by verifying that the MacBook got a different IP address post decline. And that's what should fail. Mm -hmm. um, it just jumps around a lot. Yeah, so this is the rough story. Does that make sense so far? I think so. I think you're gonna have to show me a little bit of like the test infrastructure you have here. Cause I know I think I saw like the request function at first. So what I imagine here is we're going to uh, I guess we can do this in like kind of a serial way. We don't really need like go routines, like spinning up long running processes, right? Or... Exactly. This is going to be very serial. Um, should be easy to test. Um, okay. So we have a helper here, which uh, is going to construct a discover packet. I see. Okay. Uh, we can just call the surf DHCP on our handler. Um, we need to pass in the message type again here. Mm -hmm. um, and then the response that we get, we can verify it, right? Um, and I think like we already have a test, I believe, uh, which should verify the, sorry, if you jump around, I can't jump around anymore. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were still following me. 
yep. your thing. Yep. Um, so the test request expired, I think. Yeah, see, so we already have like a relatively similar structure here where we deal with, um, why don't we get two computers at least um, and then verify that they expire after a certain time. Sure. So we're just gonna copy this and then gonna retrofit it onto the to-dos that we've written here. Are you still following my window or can I scroll down? Uh, I, I I think I am, but uh, if you want to take over, feel free. Oh no, I just I can't see the code right now in my own browser. But oh, um, I'm gonna say unfollow participant. Yeah, because we're sure. working on the same file anyway. So yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Sorry about that. Yep. Okay, um, so we can see here that we have the hardware addresses um, of you know two laptops, XPS yes. and MVP. MVP being the MacBook Pro. Um, these are just you know one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it doesn't actually matter. Um. And then we have in the handler that we're uh, getting from the test handler here, we have a time now function that we can use to override whatever time the handler thinks it is right now so that we don't have dependencies on the local system. And later on, we're just gonna say, oh yeah, and now fast forward three hours, at which point the um, lease will have expired. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, um, so let's see. So we have the uh, MacBook requests a new lease. Yep, so this is actually here. roughly the same. Here. Yeah, we have that already. So we can just, we probably can just use that. So there is no discover here. So this is assuming that the MacBook is already aware of the DHCP server. Yeah, let's see. So this does a request. Oh yeah, this does a request for this specific address. Right, yeah. Which I think that's okay. This is not the part that we're interested in testing. Okay, so we don't need to worry about the discover flow at all. We're just strict to talking about request and uh, decline. For now. Yes. Uh, later on, we're gonna actually also do a discover. Okay. Uh, oops, so MacBook requests a new lease. We have that MacBook lease expires is the uh, adding three hours to the current time. Yes. Then we have switch requests a new lease and should request the same IP address that the MacBook had. Here we have this, but it says XPS, so we're gonna... Um... Search and replace, or... Sure. How does this work? Show me. Uh, control, <laughs> control F will pop up a little menu. So if I just okay. do Control F, uh, XPS replace with switch, just in this little area. Um, like the other thing is we don't want to replace them all. So if I just do this, this, and this. Okay. And there we go. And jump back right, down cool. to the bottom of the file. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, so then we have switch, and then the, the switch lease expires. Um, that is the point that we need to add. So we, do we need to advance the clock again for the switch lease to expire? Exactly. Okay. Uh, yep, you've got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're just going to do another three hours because why not? Sure. I guess ultimately it doesn't really matter as long as the lease expires, like we could we could pass by an entire year or 10 years, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's just a little bit easier if we're actually ever going to print these clock values ah, um, right. to make them you know, humanly understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, I see I see DHCPD has an option ping check. It pings and waits one second by default. I'd rather have a couple of recently verified unused IPs maintained by GoRoutine because latency matters and just easy to do and go. Yeah, it would be an improvement, I think. Um, but hmm. also at the same time, I don't think it's actually necessary. Um, I see DHCP D is a little bit, you know, paranoid in this regard, um, which might be might be desired on on larger like university networks or other large access networks. Um, in this particular case, I think it's a little bit overkill to do this right now. But hmm. you know, we can always come back later and decide to go for it. Certainly, uh, it could be worth filing an issue about if you're interested. It could be worth uh, you know discussing that if this is something you're interested in, perhaps contributing to. So. Yeah, I mean, if somebody wanted to contribute it, um, I would be willing to entertain it if it is not too complicated. Like, you know, if you look at the DHCP 4D code, um, it's not actually that long, right? It's like not even 400 lines of code. So, you know, just adding like the separate coroutine with uh, pinging logic and uh, mutexes for synchronization, et cetera, it's going to be adding some code. So it needs to be in proportion to the value that it adds. And I'm Indeed. just not excited about that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so now, um, if it requests, oh, look, we already have a request any, but I, oh yeah, because this doesn't discover actually. Um, oh, and then the discover the address is actually ignored, I believe. Um, let's let's quickly double check this. Um, I think in our discover handler, um, we're gonna offer the previous lease on our terms, but I think we're not gonna actually look at the requested address, uh, which I think, Oh yeah, I think rec IP is the request IP address. Yes. And I don't think we're using rec IP in this branch. Oh no, we do actually. We try to offer the request IP if any and available. Okay, cool. 
Um, that's fair. So that's actually not not a hundred percent correct. Um, we should probably change this here. Um, anyway, um, we're gonna remove. Are we gonna remove this? Wait. Let's see. Let's play this through. So we had these two different cases here as well, right? Yep. Um, loop iteration one. Um, we had requests same address, and in loop iteration two, requests any address. Right. So it will request, it will de decline, and then it will request again for any address. Exactly. So what we right. should see here is um, the, I'm going to remove this. Sure. Because we want the discover to happen here. Uh, Michael, we have a question for you in the chat. Do we need oh. two machines? I was just checking if DHCP decline result to a new IP should be enough. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need two machines. Where did you get that from? Uh, uh, that was from my chat. In the multi-stream. No, no. I mean, where did the the uh, uh, who who asked the question? Where did they get it from? Um, because like we're not doing anything with multiple machines, right? We're just literally doing the uh, request response flow here. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. The DHCP decline afterwards, we expect to to have a different IP address here. Yeah. So we don't actually need the switch code at all, right? Um, the switch code. What? Oh, uh, so, oh, that's what you mean. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think um, that's what the so, I think that's what the chatter is asking. Oh yeah, now I get it. Um, because in theory, like the you know the MacBook could decide to just decline the IP for whatever reason. I mean, true, it's true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, why don't we leave it in for now? Sure. Um, we're going to run the test. Once the test fails as expected, we're going to clean that up and verify that all of these assumptions hold. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, so the loop, we're just going to unroll it manually, right? So yes. we're going to say MVP requests previous address. Um, and then we do the discover as, as expected, and then we should get an offer for the IP address that we wanted. So that is correct. Actually, why don't we actually run this test? Oh, uh, I can't. Can you? Uh, didn't we? Hang on a sec. I can run it. Yes, but... Got offered this and is in use. Yeah, let me pull this up uh, in a, the terminal window to be a lot larger. I thought I gave you permission to run uh, tests and everything, didn't I? Yeah, I think you need to do this every time. Ah, okay. Um, do you remember how to do that? <laughs> I think I needed to like. Hmm. It, at some point, it asked me, and I think this was. Oh, because you're in the terminal as well. Yeah, that is that is true. I think you need to start sharing a terminal, and then I can start running the tests, and then it pops up a question for you. I think yeah, that, like work. that sounds right. Uh, let's see here. The thing is, I don't remember how to do it, but I think it actually might be in the sharing menu. Shared terminals, new. Read, write. Okay. Uh, we should now have a shared read, write terminal. Uh, let's see we here. Uh, there we go. Uh, how can I get um, this to display on the side again? Sorry. I'll, I'll work on that. You can go ahead and continue. Yeah. I do not have a lot of uh, screen space right now. Um, no, right. it still doesn't work. Um, if needed, ask them to enable it. This this house doesn't allow running. It's kind of weird. Hmm. We got this working the other day, but the thing is, is we're, all, we're both still pretty new to VS Code live sharing. So how do I move this up to the maximize? Nope, that's not what I wanted. Sorry. <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. So the, the code is is currently verifying like the other way around, right? Um, because this was for testing the DHCP NAC. Um, so what we want here is the the addresses should actually be equal. So if they're not equal, um, we should say DHCP offer for wrong IP. Uh, about this one this one. Okay. So the test is um, currently running and passing. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, so this is now doing go watch right now. Right. Yeah, I'll just I'll just run it in my terminal. We can, this way, every, anytime we save the file, it will change. So yeah, it'll run good. again. Cool. Okay, so the request, the previous address, we have that working now. So we are currently here. Right. Um. So what we should do now here is send a DHCP decline. Um. And then essentially do the same thing here again. So I'm a little and rusty this... on my DHCP flow, but the so what happens here is the server sends the client sends a discover, the server sends an offer. So the client would send a request, 
Or no, the client was sent a server sends an offer with the previous IP. Is that what it is? That's correct. Yeah. So um, we receive the it, offer and then we send to client. Say again. So we so a client sends discover server sends offer with the previous IP and then the client should send a decline. Uh, yeah, in practice, it would actually accept the IP address and then only afterwards figure out that it was already in use. But I think we can also just send a decline directly um, and then verify because our behavior doesn't rely on on it actually getting the IP address. I see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to refill my water. I'll be back in just a sec. Yeah, for sure. Unexpected message type. Hmm. Uh, we're going to leave it like this for now. Let's see. This fails. Return unexpected address. Yeah, because it's still handing out the same IP address. Um, requests any address. And then in here, change request to not actually request any address. OK, I'm um, back. And the expectation here is that we will get a different IP address. So the offer returned, let's see here. Okay, so now we have the test failing, right? And I yes. think we should be able to get it to pass. Um, wait, we also need to add a DHCP decline, but then the test should still fail and then we get it to pass by actually implementing the DHCP decline. Right, because there's no handler for decline at the moment. That's correct, yeah. Uh, but there's also no client code to send a decline yet. So uh, we'll also need to do that. Um, so if we go to the request, um, this, so I, I added these little helper functions here to construct the packets because it was uh, being duplicated all over. Yeah. But um, we will need to uh, request, uh, or um, maybe we'll need to like construct a new packet type here. Oh, as far as the uh, decline goes, right? Um, yes, exactly. Uh, so I think we, we should be able to maybe express this. So if we do a func decline, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have like a specific address that it includes. What does this do if we don't have address? Oh, it would just be like all zero bytes. That should be okay, actually. So this is the crawlaw DHCP? Okay, I've used this before. It's been a long time, but let me pull up the API docs too. So you're assuming a fixed transaction ID. I guess that's probably fine. Yeah, um, I'm just using the fixed transaction ID uh, for the tests here. I see. Decline. Um, the address. We're probably just going to replace the address with uh, zero at a later point. Oops. Um, and then the hardware address, and then an ops of which we don't have any. OK, um, so now if we go back to the very bottom. I just want to clarify really quick here. So the address would be zero because the client is saying the client is that field is used for saying your address, right? And the client is refusing it. So it will say all zeros. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And that is my understanding. I can pull up the trace and verify this uh, in a second in the background, but um, yeah, I think that's how it works. Sure. Okay. So now the decline handler, um, I think what it will result in is, well, actually, why don't we see what it will result in? So we're going to see, uh, I'll do it like this. Let's see what this prints. Oh, yeah. Uh, nice. Some bytes. <laughs> yep. Bytes of this DHCP packet. That is not very helpful. Um, yeah. And they're in I decimal, think... no less. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had this helper for message type. Uh, we're going to print this instead. Um, what's the shortcut for scroll to the very bottom of this file? Uh... I think I maybe I usually just use page down. Maybe end will work as well. Uh, nope. Yeah, I tried this. It doesn't work for some reason. I wonder if there's like the Vim key bindings, like the capital G or whatever. It's been years since I've done that, but yeah, I don't know. I don't have that extension installed though. Okay, so we're just gonna print the message type here. Yep. Offer. So, so a decline <laughs> results in an off. Oh no, wait. This is because we we didn't change. We're the sending. Message type here. Yeah. Oh, Panic. Wow. Oh, nice. fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> line 31? 31. Um, in so the, that would be the test helper we just created, possibly, right? So oh, line... the message type on nil, I think. That is the problem. 
uh, if the response is yes, no, yes, specify the message type option as well. DHCP decline was not answered. Yeah, nice. Okay, so that now matches our understanding, right? Um, okay, so now we have this uh, switch statement here in the DHCP server, and what we can just do right. is uh, we'll just add like a new branch here, Let's say case DHCP four dot decline. Uh, if this so it indents correctly, mm -hmm. um, and then we're just gonna um, use this here, construct reply packet. I'm going to see how far we come. Actually, I don't even know if it needs to be uh, acknowledged the DHCP declines. So why don't we, um, why don't we actually pull up the RFC, HTTP four RFC, this one, um, or is it a newer version? It's a very old RFC. I'm sure there is a. Um, Sometimes if I'm cheating, I'll look at Wikipedia really quick and just see if there's a like a diagram, you know. Yeah, let's see. The server receives the DHCP decline message. The client has discovered through some other means that the suggested network address is already in use. It's precisely what's happening here. Indeed. The server must mark the network address as not available and should notify the local system administrator of a possible configuration problem. But it doesn't say that it needs to actually acknowledge the message in any way. Right. Uh, so this actually ties in nicely with a question from the chat. So is there a maximum number of DHCP declines from a client? A server should mark an IP as unavailable if it receives a decline. So if there are too many declines, there will be a problem, right? Yeah, that is correct. That is, uh, that is often the problem uh, in local networks when you have a client that is misbehaving intentionally in a way like that. Um, you have similar problems with, uh, I believe, IPv6 um, neighbor discovery, where you can just always, when somebody, when some new device assess I have this new IP address. Does anybody else have this? Like, is it already in use? You can always just say yes, and then you will not be able to like get a new IP address on your network. Mm -hmm. uh, so often the the trick is to add like some sort of rate limit here, um, some sort of of anti abuse mechanism. Uh, for this particular project, we have the luxury that is uh, running in homes where the devices are trusted, or if the devices are misbehaving, uh, we have people with physical power over them, and they can make them behave. <laughs> uh, that's know, what that's what hammers are for, right? <laughs> Is the lease state persisted, or did you find that it's actually not required because the client requests the old IP? The lease state is actually persisted. Um, we're doing this partly so that you can actually inspect the state and so that you can modify the state. Um, so to change an IP address assignment of the DHCP server in router 7 from a dynamic assignment to a static assignment, what you do is you change the JSON file, uh, which is the database for the IP addresses, and you remove the expiration. <laughs> you can do this in the text editor. Um, you can. Uh, you can now also do things in the web interface for the DHCP server, uh, like renaming um, leases. So whenever you want to um, change a lease, give it a different host name. Like for example, if your printer comes up with like a super long string that is like BW8162 or something, um, then you can just rename it to printer or something. And you can very easily do that, not by editing the state file, which you can also do, but also in the web interface. Um, so the, uh, one of the guiding principles also of router seven is that all of the state and all of the interchanges between processes uh, should be as human um, readable as possible. And you know you should be able to modify them, introspect them, uh, look at what's happening, understand it, and deal with issues in a text editor ideally. So as far as I can tell for the decline, it should not result in an ACK. Uh, actually, wait, isn't there the DHCP negative ACK as well? So there's the... Yeah, there's a NAC, but yeah. I... I, I just don't think... Uh, I can't remember what it does. It's a PB client. Um, is there maybe a PCAP file that we can look at? Uh, sometimes you can find these on, on Wireshark. There's like sample captures. But the sample captures of DHCP might not actually include the scenario that we're interested in. Oh, so I think that the uh, I think the DHCP NAC or negative acknowledgement is basically the server's equivalent. Like, does the client request an address and the server's like, no, you can't have that, versus the client saying decline. Yep. So I believe it is the server side equivalent. So we can skip that for now. So let's see if, if this has any information here. Yeah, I think this might be entirely informational. So yep. I mean, in that case, um, we should change our test to not actually, um, we should actually verify that. There was no answer. Did. So if there if there was an answer at all, Right. 
So then in the decline, we will actually not reply with the packet at all. We will return nil. Exactly. Right, so I'm on the code over there, so I'll change that to nil. So decline, there's no. Okay. Um, so uh, one more thing that we need to change is the request to not actually uh, request an address. So what we're going to do here, um, I think there is a net.ipv4.0. Yes, there is. Yep. Yeah. So we're just going to use this. Yep. Um, and now what does our test say? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's passing. It's passing. Oh, wait. Yes. Uh, so I, I modified the DHCP server to remove the, uh, the packet we were generating in response to a decline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I thought that it should actually wait. So it's failing if these addresses are equal. So it's actually now getting a separate IP address. Um, and I think in response to it, so, okay, so our test is not actually sufficient right now, right? Um, because the test passes too early. Um, so something is still not right. And I think the something here is that um, in the DHCP code path up until now, we were running into the discover. And then we were running into the requested IP address path. Right. And what we should be running into is the lease hardware um, path, path, a code path where um, we actually consult the state. Um, and I think it might not be in the state right now. Hmm. Oh, so you need to specify, you need to add something to the, like the leases database? Wait, actually, I'm just seeing here that the lease must also not be expired for this scenario. So this is interesting. Um, what were you asking? Uh, I think I, I think I got confused. You can, I don't think I, I already forgot. <laughs> Sorry. So why don't we actually add these debug statements here? See yep. if they help us understand what's happening here. Uh, I can run with dash V one sec. Yeah. Thanks. So can lease equals 21 and find lease nine one ninety one. Okay. But I think these are, these are uh, separate iterations as well. Right. So, um, these are different add... parts of the subtest. A log.printf um, before request or before request without address. Make it really clear. So now what we're seeing here is find lease equals 191. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now I'm wondering a little bit. Um, Okay, let, let me do one thing. Um, let me pull up the packet capture in the yep. background. Sounds um, good. Sorry, I don't know this on screen. No, that's fair. Uh, like this contains all of the addresses uh, internal to my network. Um, okay, so we have the um, discover offer request act decline. And then in the next discover, oh no, wait, see, this is the wrong file. We have the full context here. Decline request. Okay, so the server was definitely offering the, the client the address. Um, and the client in the discover did not specify any IP addresses. Yeah, so can lease was never invoked and either a lease was not found in the lease HW function or it was expired. So I think, um, let me let me actually go back here. I think this, this might be a subtle issue with our test actually. Okay. Um, so what we want is um the switch lease expired oh yeah i think this might be um our logical mistake because here all of the leases expired correct we only need one of the leases to expire we only need the yes so the, this way the switch has the lease and then the switch lease does not expire so the server treats it as still in use 
right? Yeah, and, then, so and then the MacBook yeah. will try and request it? Actively is in the database here, right? Because yeah. the MacBook asks for one, the server gives it one, and then the server thinks we're done, right? And then the MacBook realizes, oh no, this IP address is not usable. Yeah. But the server continuously thinks that the MacBook should get this address that it handed it and that is active and not expired. Yes. Um, so the code path was actually correct. Like, we'll need to hit this. And for this to, to for, for us to be able to hit this, we need to not only um, offer, like not only discover an IP address and get an offer, we also need to request it. So that the server actually um, has it in use. So you were you were asking earlier, right? And I was like, oh yeah, we probably don't need the full uh, flow, but we do actually need it. Um, <laughs> So that's why it's good to always verify your assumptions uh, yeah, when you're writing these. Um, so let me just search for request. Um, yeah, this should be good. So, so discover and then a request. You want to get an ACK. Oh, so the hmm. so would the the MacBook would send a request and then a decline. It would not skip from discover to decline. Exactly. Oh, okay. I see. I wasn't sure how the decline flow worked. I see. Uh, line five fifty two. Okay, you got yep. it. Okay, what's it saying now? Oh, sorry. Uh, something about syntax error. Uh, we're good. Okay. Uh, Lisa's yeah. hardware equals twenty one. Yeah, this this I think is exactly what we want, right? So let's I see. believe so. Um, yes. Yeah. Now it goes into the Lisa's HW, um, and it says, "Oh yeah, you should just get the same IP address again." Yeah. So yes. now we have failing the precise way that we want it to fail. Precisely, because the server still believes that it belongs to the MacBook, or the server thinks the MacBook can take it. Yeah. Yeah. So this to do is where we are now. Um, change requests not actually requests an address. We have done this with the net.ipv40. Uh, this log line can go. Uh, so now I think the, the test is OK. Um, we can simplify this later by removing the switch, um, as people have noted on the chat. I'm going to add to do remove switch device entirely. Yeah. Actually, we should probably do this now, um, because now it's the time when we have the test failing. And we know that it's failing legitimately, so to say. Yeah, that's true. Um, so switch grabs the same address. That's OK. If we just remove this, should still fail the same way. Yeah. Unexpected address, 192.168. Uh, yeah, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we can remove the switch here. We can make this a little bit simpler. Just um... Yeah, we can actually remove the whole map uh, shortly. But... Exactly. Yep. And then, uh, of course, we also need to update this here and right. wherever we use hardware address. So here, uh, it's probably a better way to do this for people to actually use VS Code. Yeah, I can do it with multi-cursor if you'd like, or OK, either way. Yeah, but there's just one left, so. Yep, no problem. It's the, the tragedy of learning editors is that it's often faster to just do by hand. Exactly, uh, yeah. Good function for. Control okay, D. Um, hmm. So. Let's see. Yeah. So what we want to do now is um, go to the definition here. So we have the uh, lease HW, which um, will give. So the, the the state here is a little bit interesting because we need it keyed by multiple things, right? Um, and there have been subtle issues before um, when I was using pointers, and then I had these two maps that were using pointers. Um, and if they get out of sync somehow for any reason, then uh, yeah, that that really introduces uh, subtle issues into the program. So Chaos. <laughs> now I, have is I have one map that just contains um, numbers, which is the index into the other. So one of them is just like essentially a reference at a very high level to the other map. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it solves any sort of state out of sync issues, but also means that the uh, access is a little bit more complicated. Right. Uh, but yeah, not not too bad. Um, so let's see. Um, I think what we want to do is essentially there's like set leases. Let's look at how the DHCP server actually does it when you do a request. Sure. Um, so here is uh, where we persist a new lease. Um, and I think I think what should actually be um, 
Okay, so I think it should be good enough if upon a DHCP decline, we just expire all of the leases that are assigned to the hardware address that the decline came from. That should be enough to make the code work because uh, in the offer code path here, um, you can see that it not only checks the leases hardware, but it also checks if the lease is expired. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is that the MacBook uh, lease is still active, actually, right. even though it's not usable. So right. if it expired quickly upon the HCP decline, um, that should be a way to trigger a new IP address to uh, to be put out. Right. So the client's telling us for whatever condition it finds, for whatever reason it finds this unsatisfactory. So for the time being, we return it to the pool. We don't put it in like a temporary like uh, blacklist. Uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No blacklist. Um, I think it is good enough to just say, okay, if if you say you're unhappy, we're going to give up all of our state for you, and you'll start over. Yep. Uh, which will result in a new random IP address. Yep. Sounds good to me. Um, so what we're going to do here is um, we're going to do the copy this here, um, lease hardware. And if that is actually, we're going to make the other way around. Uh, if there is no state, we're just going to return because there's nothing to update. Yeah. So if you great. decline, but there was no state, we don't care. Like it just means that nothing, it's no up. Exactly. Um, oh, and that should actually go, well, we're going to leave it here for now. We can find a better place for it later. Um, so if we go in here, what we want to do, I think, is the, um, so what we get is the lease. And I think in the lease, yeah, we have the num, and that is like the index um, for leases IP. And Lisa's HW is just a reference, so we don't even need to update Lisa's HW. In fact, the lease that we get is already a pointer, so I think we can just directly change its expiration, um, change the expiry here. Right, within the map. Yeah. Um, so, do it quick. So, I think we need to do this, strictly speaking, under mutex, because we can't just, you know, uh, can't just change uh, a field here yeah. without protection. Right. Uh, we're going to need to introduce like a little helper here. Um, and that's probably also a good, actually, okay. Oh, you want to factor out this uh, lease manipulation yeah. code? It's a good place for you in a second to uh, make VS Code really shine and show me how to factor this out perfectly. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that part, but. <laughs> All right. Um, so expiry, we can just say time that now, right? Um, and then we know that any call to time dot now after this one will have a different um, monotonic clock timestamp and will fail the comparison. Would you not just want to set like time dot time like empty struct because that way it's guaranteed to be in the past? We could, but this way you also know when the expiration happened, right? Like if you're going to look at the state database, you're going to see oh, up until here is when it was valid, and then you can cross correlate that with the DHCP decline packet that you might see in your capture. I see. Okay. Okay, so I think now we're at the stage where I would want this code in a separate function. Right. Is there like a refactoring thing that you know of in VS Code? Uh, so I can just, I don't know, I would just type it out with a, a little snippet here probably. So uh -huh. what's the type here? So the type is the handler? Uh, yeah. So h handler uh, exported, and then this would be, oh, expire lease or? Yeah, yeah, why not? And would this uh, require the lock to be called? Yeah, let, let's say expire lease for now, um, and the parameter that it should get is the hardware address. Um, HW address. That's what, okay, that's the convention you like, sure. Exactly. Yep. So yeah, I don't have any fancy refactoring other than that, but we can just copy and paste that code in there. <laughs> so. Now, would this be, so would this code want to invoke the lock itself, or would it require the caller to have the lock beforehand? This should do it itself, I think. I think we... I think it's probably cleaner to get the locks out of the handler itself if we can. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let me just uh, cut this here, paste it here. Yep. Uh, and then here we can just going to say expire lease HW adder, which I think is in scope from earlier. Should this return anything? Like, do we care about this returning perhaps the expiration time that was set or? No, okay. I don't think so. Um, what we do want to have is, um, what we do want to have is a little debug message here, though. Um, yep. 
right? This is like, strictly speaking, a little layering violation, right? Because we have the DHCP decline in here. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So if we factored this out, I assume we're going to use it in more than one place, right? Yeah. Why don't we actually use a little Boolean here, which just returns whether it did expire something. And then yep. we can make reactive. And then that actually goes here where it belongs. Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, so how's our test doing? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I've run it a little bit. Oh, looks like it hung for a while. Okay, there we go. So syntax uh, oh, error yeah. is 357. So HW editor, where's that coming to scope? Is that from the packet? It might be that it's not actually in scope. Let me see. Right, so it's coming or, from... Or, oh, no, it is in scope, but it is a string. Should it be a string? Wait, what's the R message? Cannot use HR type string. Yeah. Net. Oh, so, um, yeah, I think this is just... Oh, it is a string. It's not a Mac, right. Okay, yep. Yeah, yeah. you'll need to change that. Indeed. Uh, okay, it uh, looks like right now the test is hung. So if I sig quit and... Is it, is it really hung or is it passing? Uh, no, it was hung for five seconds. Okay. So I know these tests take less than a second to run, right? So let's see here. Yeah. Oh, is it? Do we have an issue here with our leases? Uh, with our um, oh locks? Do we lock in multiple places? Double lock. Um, yes. Because these HW also returns this. So this would be at least we'll HW need, locks now, or we'll need to copy this um, or refactor it so that lease HW can be called under lock uh, has like a little helper, but this Correct. is not much. So what we can just do here is. Um, we just inline this essentially, right? And then we say to do um, if this is not okay, return false as well. And if l dot hardware adder turns out to no longer be the hardware address, return false as well. And then that that is that should work. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you run tests again? Yep. I think it's actually working. Okay, test pass. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So going back to our test code now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think that is it. I think that is our fix. Yeah. Uh, MacBook sends a request, and it will get an address that is not equal to the one it had before. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Um, that should be it. Do you want to commit it? Uh, yeah, certainly. Do we care about testing any of these other cases? Not really. Um, oh, one thing that we do care about is um, running all the tests again. So if you could just yes. do another make test. Yep, you got it. Uh, ready to go? Yep. Okay, running. Uh, just download the code to play with sending IP to DNS when I run GoMod tidy. Multiple lines are removed from GoMod. Is there any reason to have those in GoMod? Probably the, not. From the chat. Um, yeah, I don't know for sure. I think there might be. I think there might be mismatches in you know in which context you run things. Like, are you running the tests? Are you, um, like building it for other build tags. Like there there are a couple of subtle influences that result in different things ending up in Go mod. Um, I think Go mod tidy might be a little more aggressive um, and the Go tool itself might be a little more lenient to make things work. Right. Um, I, I don't know for sure without looking at the specific case, uh, what is happening in your case. So I take it you wanted those uh, debug lines commented out again for the leases HW and et cetera up here? Oh yeah, exactly. Okay. So we'll commit everything except for the uh, make file changes. Yep. Let's take a quick look. Beautiful. Okay. Oh, this time in the commit message, we're going to reference the issue. Yes, of course. This is issue number 40. Uh, sure. All DHCP 4D. So it's funny because on my router it is DHCP D4 for the or the uh, yeah so I get that really confused. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, handle order, like what Goma Tidy does. Yeah, I, I think that is what I was kind of alluding to. Like depending on what other commands you ran, 
um, your go mod will grow a little bit, and then go mod tidy makes it nice and clean, I suppose. But yeah. Fixes. Uh, what's the issue number? Sorry. Uh, forty. Fixes number forty. All right, and oops. Uh, dash u fork head. There we go. Alrighty. Two pull requests down. That one was actually uh, substantial, so cool. Yeah. Very, very yeah, nice. Good work. Yeah. Likewise, uh, it's fun It's fun doing this uh, you know, pairing type of thing. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, seems sufficient to me. So. Excellent. Okay. Uh, pull request number 48. Yep. Wait for the CI okay. to run. Oops. Quick look while the CI runs. Right. Yep. It looks like we didn't mess anything up in committing. Um, if the CI passes, then we should be good to merge. Yep, sounds good. OK. Very cool. Like on the detail here. Uh, yeah, any more questions from the chat or et cetera? I see we've got a, we've got a good number of folks following along. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Uh, what keyboard do I use? I also use the Kinesis Advantage, but I use the Advantage 2. So it is a nice split ergonomic keyboard. Very fun. It's the kind of thing where you will never really, uh, you think you'll never get used to it. It takes a couple of weeks, but it is well worth the trouble. So where is yeah, it? Maybe if somebody could post this into both of the chats um, so that it's here again. The, just a link to my latest blog post. Ta -da. Yep. Spec. Yeah, nice. Uh, that should be a thing for the uh, blog. Specs. I think Taryn, yeah, Taryn added that command to my channel. Sweet. Specs. Um, can you make specs also print the link to my post as well, in case people are curious? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see here. So is that commands edit, Taryn? Um, I don't actually remember. I can pull up Nightbot manually, but perhaps it'll be faster than me. Yeah, number one on Hacker News. Nice. <laughs> Still? I don't know. It's just yeah. funny. It's just funny how HN is uh, so fickle sometimes. Uh, yes, yeah, for sure. Uh, I've got it, Taryn. Don't worry about it. Thank you, though. Just in case you're uh, not making coffee. Commands edit. Okay, cool. So now if we type specs into Nightbot, there we go. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, so the CI is still, still running. Um, I think it's about to start test now, though, so it should be done any second. Excellent. Okay. Um, as you mentioned earlier, once this is on GitHub Actions, it should be substantially faster. Yeah, totally. Just because your Actions runs faster, like they have better hardware or allocate more resources. I don't know. Hey, hey. nice. Uh, thank, you for, yeah, thank you for joining the stream. I appreciate it. All right, time to go back to uh, sitting mode. Wash and merge. Nice. All right. So this is fixed. Sorry. Um, so to recap real quick for the people who have just joined us, um, what we just did was uh, we fixed a bug where, you know, if a Mac joins the network and uh, it figures out that an IP address is uh, conflicting, like already in use for whatever reason, it sends a DHCP decline. And now the router 7 DHCP server actually respects this and will give it a different IP address on the next request. Yep. No, the, the person's correct. Um, the uh, Kinesis comes by default with the brown cherry MX key switches. Cool. Yeah, I was going to say, they don't sound loud enough to be blues, but I couldn't remember if they were reds or browns, but... Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go back. Um, we are churning through these. So now we only have the native DIN DNS support and the uh, blocking incoming IPv6 left. I think uh, DIN DNS would be worth tackling. Yeah, yeah. Because um, the, uh, the NF table more. stuff might take us a good yeah. amount of time and potentially some splunking. Yeah, you wanted to do three hours, I think, roughly. Uh, so I think this this fits well. The uh, blocking might be uh, a little bit too involved now. Yeah, totally. Cool. Um, <laughs> I wonder if there's a way to use your viewers in a stream like this, right? Some GitHub project with PRs. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, 
Maybe. Uh, it, it might be hard to get all of the viewers up to speed on you know the, the minimum requirements for contributing to any project, really, though. But if you wanted to do it in like sort of a uh, multi multi stream thing where you know the first stream is uh, get to grips with the project, set up everything up, uh, and the next one is actually tackling some smaller issues, I think that could work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, this is this is relatively easy to do and relatively easy to test, um, and we can actually have this uh, live largely, you know outside of of uh of the router 7 main repository like this could start out as a separate package yeah um and then you know eventually be moved in the correct place whatever the correct place is or we could decide we'll make it a proper sub command um in the router 7 package to begin with um either way it's probably fine um i don't think there's going to be too much too much uh churn and too much change actually so i don't think we necessarily need to start in a separate repository yeah, sounds um, so good. We're just, uh, we're just gonna develop it in the Roger Seven repository for for uh, making it easier right now. Sure, sounds good. Uh, feel free to get the uh, folder structure going. I'm just taking a look at this libdns documentation really quick to see what the uh, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. So you said you use uh, Cloudflare as your provider. Exactly. Okay. Is there a provider for them already? Yep, there is a Cloudflare package here. Excellent. Um, one thing that I don't know is what the testing story is for libdns. Like, if there's already a test helper package or something like this. Yeah, well, it looks like these are all interfaces, so it should be pretty easy. But I don't, yeah, I don't know for sure either. Yeah, libdns like the the main package is really just the interfaces, I think. Yes. And I don't see anything with test in its name. No, me either. There's actually uh, no tests in the Cloudflare stuff either. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You know, project getting off the ground, but yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we can find anything that already imports it. Caddy TLS. Well, that's not a big surprise. Yeah. Um, and Caddy Dynamic DNS. Let's see what Caddy Dynamic DNS does. Caddy app that keeps your DNS A records updated. Yeah, this is pretty much what we want. Yep. Um, though we don't want it as a Caddy app. We just want it as a standalone program that is well integrated with the router 7 thing. Right. But we can see what they do here and if they have any tests, right? Um, so they have the check IP and update DNS, which is exactly the logic that we're going to write. Uh, IP source, there. no tests either here. Oof. Yeah, OK. Um, so <laughs> assume it just works. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I take, it, I take it that the Cloudflare package probably that's being imported here is doing a lot of the work. Uh, no, actually, OK, it's not. There is no Cloudflare package. It's all in here. Oh, OK. So I think the the first step would actually be to like write a little test around this, right? Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny because like I uh, I, I tend to find that until I find kind of the, the shape of the API I'm looking for that I have a hard time writing tests first, but it's interesting to see the way you work, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll do it together and see what works, right? Sounds um, good. I just want to have a test first um, because also, you know, if, if you write the test first, it also influences the way you write the API, right? Um, if you need That's it true. to be testable from the very beginning, then you can't make the mistake of having it not testable somehow. Right. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, let me open up the file tree here. Um, so what we want to do is, OK, so the, the general structure, which you know um, you might be well familiar with, but I'm just going to explain for the for the stream, of course. Um, is we have this CMD subdirectory here, uh, which stands for command. And these are all the binaries. Like uh, every directory here has um, a package main in here. Um, these are all going to be separate commands that are going to run and be uh, they're going to be running on our router. Um, so we would want to have like a din DNS in here, yep. um, an additional command. Um, and what the program itself, like the cmd main.go, um, should do is just just be a very tiny wrapper around an internal package that then does like all of the logic um, and that we're then going to test. So in fact, we can even start out um, not having the command at all. And we can just straight up go to the internal. Um, I'm going to say um, new folder. Yep. That'd be um, din DNS. Din DNS. And then in here, a new file, dnf.go. Yep, there we go. Uh, just going to copy this over here. Sure. And say package dnf. And then 
um, oh, I need to click here, new file, dns-test.go. I'm going to start out making it a white box test, I think. Actually, yeah, same package. So we have access to the internals for now. I think sure. it's going to be a little bit more convenient. Um, and then, um, so wait, so what do we actually want to test? So this is good to, to think about, right? Because now we can think about the functionality of the package, what, right. it, what it should. Um, so on a high level, like we're going to check the IP addresses. We're going to look at the IP addresses that the um, that the router has on its network interfaces, right? So it's going to be uh, uplink zero is the interface um, and the IP address that it has on there. There's only going to be one IPv4 address it has on there. And that is what we want to update. Um, and then uh, copyright year might need an update as well. Yeah, actually, it does not necessarily. Like, it is OK to put the year that you started working on a project in there. Um, OK. But some people are stricter about this. Some people are less strict. Um, I do it like this. This seems to be OK. Yep. Um, so funk, fun, let, let's just say funk test, uh, test something. And then we're going to add a couple of to-dos and figure this out. So um, we, we specify an IP address, because getting an IP address from the interface is not an interesting thing to test right, right. now. Um, this is not the main logic. This might actually end up in the command. Right. Um, the DNS package itself should not concern itself with, with that layer. Um, so we specify an IP address. Um, we want to verify that it is being updated correctly. And that actually, I think this brings us to why this package doesn't already have like a test util. Um, because, you know, I think we almost might have to assume that it works, right? Because this is talking to for example, Cloudflare, um, and if their API misbehaves, like we can't tell. Right. So I think if we wanted to, for example, test that it sends a well-formed Cloudflare request, we would need to actually do this in the Cloudflare libdns package. So this is not for us to test, right? Um, this is both not the right place and also like, yeah, it would be brittle. It wouldn't be worth it. So I think within um, this package, we're going to be just using the libdns interface types, then your main would actually wire in the Cloudflare specific bits, right? Exactly. Um, so what we would test here is that the libdns interface right. is called with the correct parameters. Right. Um, yeah. So let's let's um, verify that libdns is called correctly. So we would like set up a you know mock DNS provider which satisfies the interface and logs calls something like this. Um, and then the the logic of the DIN DNS is going to be super simple, right? Because um, essentially, um, there's probably going to be like a provider of sorts. The interface will need to figure out which one it is. So this could be like the the first signature of the function, right? Um, assuming that we don't have any other state and don't need like a state struct or anything. Yeah. Uh, it obviously also needs a record, right? So now it's getting more complicated. So um, so now we actually need to have a look at what the libdns API, like how does it work, right? So yeah. let's check out the So I was just checking it out. We have this record setter type that has a single method, the set records. Uh, I, that appears to be what we would need. I don't think we would need, would we want the ability to query the record? So for example, to verify any, for any well, reason? I think, or... we, I think we need to query it to figure out if it's up to date or not. Okay. Because it might be that if we just unconditionally update it, we might overrun rate limits of the provider, or the provider might be unhappy about it, or you know this might trigger synchronization issues or whatever. It's better to not touch anything if it doesn't need to be touching. Right. OK, uh, record getter. So we have getter and setter, the only things we really need. So um, let me just put this in here as a note, and then the record setter. Should I, uh, should I think about what like a test fixture for these might look like? Uh, say again, sorry. Uh, I could create like a test, like a test provider or something in the meantime, if that would be helpful. Or oh yeah, cool, yeah. For okay, sure. sure. Okay, so get records returns all of the records in the DNS zone. Um, so we probably need to operate on like the zone level, and then in here we also have a record type. So let's check this out real quick. Record has an ID that is provider specific has a type, name, value, and TTLs. These are just the DNS fields. So type is going to be an A record. Name is going to be like, I don't know, din DNS dot 
servnarrow.com or something, uh, value is going to be the IP address and TTL is the time to live uh, in the caches of the DNS system. Uh, cool. Ah. Oh. oh, so one thing that we can already know is that we'll need to accept the context as well um, because all of these require a context as yes, well. Yes, right. Do you typically pass context in from your main to do things like signal handling? Yes. Okay, that's the same pattern I use. So. Yep. Okay. Um, so now, I'm not sure if this will actually if I actually find it. Uh, let's see in this. Oh yeah, it does actually. So we already have it pulled. Cool. Um, Okay, so what we will have is something that satisfies all of these interfaces, right? So the provider, um, is there like, are there multiple of these interfaces or do we need to embed these? It looks like we need to embed them. It's actually the better choice. So we're just gonna do a record getter setter. Um, I see, embed. okay, yeah, that sounds good. Cause I was implementing them on one type as well, so. How will the IP change be captured? Um, I think it will just pull for, for the time being because uh, checking the IP address on your local interface is very, very cheap. Um, so you can just do that every minute or so um, and then just do something if the state on the server end changes. Um, in addition to this on router seven, there are actually signals uh, for notification. So. For example, the netconfig D has like a list of processes that it should notify whenever the network configuration changes. So we'll just send a sick user one to it. And if we install a signal handler for that, uh, we can be triggered very quickly after something happens. <laughs> okay, so what we wanna do here is call provider.getRecords. We give it the context. Um, we give it the zone. So the zone- Needs to be parameterized. So now we have like a lot of parameters already. So we're probably going to introduce a state struct in just a sec. Yep. Sounds good um, to me. And this will give us the existing records and an error. So if we get an error, we'll just return it for now. Is this update going to be a one shot or a long running loop? So the bin DNS package, I would structure it as a one shot. And then the long running loop will be added in the main. Okay, sure. Because that makes it so much easier to test, right? Yeah, I can see I can see arguments for both approaches. Like sometimes, if you want to handle things like back off and retry, it's easier to put it in the package. But alternatively, if you just want to do something very simple every ten minutes or something, then this is the easy way. Yeah. Okay, and then we have set records, which will also take a zone, and then just the records. Um, so these would probably only be the ones that we actually want to have updated. Um, let's. Double check by reading the description here. Yep. Updates to zones so that records described in the input are reflected in the output. May create or overwrite records, or depending on the record type, delete records. Oh, um, to maintain parity with the input. Oh. Oh. <laughs> huh. So it's like not a thousand percent clear to me, but it reads like it wants all of the records that should be set in the zone, right? So it's like you get the full state out, you have to put the full state in, and then... Um... Oh no, so we have to potentially mess with any of your other records you have set up for your domain with Cloudflare? Well, we will get them from the get records, but the problem that I see here is that this is not atomic, right? Um, if there are two things that update your zones at the same time, uh, this will not work well. I see. I mean, it's probably fine for, for this particular use case, but it's not like a great design, I think. Um, however, it might be that this is a necessary compromise, right? Uh, it might be that many of the providers don't actually support uh, more finely granular updates. Yeah. Um, it's just a sublime color scheme. I think that is the VS Code default color scheme. Yeah, I don't know if you it, is, it is on yours, yeah. I've got um, mine changed slightly, but yours is that's true. It says it wants to reflect the input in the output. Yes. Well, but so the thing that tripped me up is this paragraph here where it says it may delete records to maintain parity with the input. What does that mean? 
No other records are affected. Oh yeah. So only the records we pass would be modified. Yeah. Is that is that is the deletion thing? Like under which circumstances would it delete anything? That's a good point. Because if you pass a record that's not in there, it would just assume I would assume that the provider would ignore it. Exactly. Or Yeah, so I'm not sure about that, but... Um, Do you have, like, a test account to... we could test this with before we nuke your DNS records? <laughs> yeah, I should uh, I should probably add, like, a, a dummy zone that we're going to test this with. Yeah. Um, I don't have any testing set up for this at all. Um, I don't know if I can just add, like, a new API key that I can use for the stream. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so... Yeah, this is this is confusing. I would expect a more granular API as well. Like perhaps this would be nice under some circumstances, but I would like given a single record being able to modify just that record with no other options. Yeah, Okay. Um, I can do updated some alias for existing for now. We're going to change it later. Mm -hmm. And then the new records. Okay. And at that point, we're done. Return nil, no error. Right. Okay. So this should be um, test update. So you've written this. Okay, cool. Yeah, basically um, you just pass in you just pass in the functions that you want and they are promoted yep. to the methods. So Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um so this signature is getting pretty long. Um the zone and uh, oh we don't even have the record in there, right? Um so yeah, we'll we'll need to definitely refactor this, but I think we're just gonna go with it and just uh refactor it once we know better how the API actually works. Right. So just gonna do a context of background here. Um, in fact, let's do a context with cancel, defer to cancellation, so that if anything keeps running um, after the test finishes, it will be shut down cleanly here. Yes. Not that it's important in this particular case, but it's nice to get in the habit of doing it. So we're assuming here that the provider will handle the context appropriately. Yes. Um, that is actually a documented fact um, in the uh, record getter implementations must honor context cancellation and be safe for concurrent use. I see. This is a blurb that you can find in all of these interfaces. I see. Do we need to worry about that for our tests? Or, I mean, we're not going to be testing this concurrently, are we? No. Okay. Um, so the zone, um, I don't know, something like this. This is not going to be a zone, though. Um, I think we'll need to, like, like it would need to be an actual domain, right? We I think so, it. like a top level top level zone, yeah. I suppose what we could do is uh, we could use an IPv6, um, what's it called? The reverse lookup zones. Um, uh, because pointer, the, pointer record? Yeah, exactly. Um, because I think I have one delegated for my slash 48. So if I just oh, have one nice. for that might work. Yeah. Um, though it's going to be super tricky to actually query this from the command line uh, because you can do all of this logic for like the reverse lookup. So right. I don't know. Bunch of hex gobbledygook. <laughs> uh huh. It looks like the implementation update slash create records and do not delete any, but I think the docs need an update. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, I it's really good to all of us and nobody on the stream uh, on, on the chat could also give like an, a clear authoritative answer. So I think, yes, at the very least, the docs need updating. Yep. Um, and then the provider here, so we can pass that in. Um, I mean, we can have a look at how it behaves, right? Um, if we just implemented the callbacks such that it would trigger the case that, that we were wondering about. Right. Uh, okay, so um, the provider, this is going to be a test provider. Yep. 
uh, you have the add records and set records in here. So let yep. me just copy these over. This is a funk. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, when there's a get record, what we're going to do is look in as a record, uh, no error. And we'll need to synthesize these records, right? Yeah, um, so there's a few fields in here. I don't really understand what the meaning of the ID field is. It says provider specific metadata, so perhaps like a UID. But the other ones, the other ones are all pretty standard. I mean, we could just put something in here, right? We could just say rec1 is our UUID. Sure. Uh, uh, type mm -hmm. would be A, I assume. So type name value TTL. Sorry, say again. Uh, sorry, so the, uh, I, you probably have the documentation up as well, but I'm looking at the fields. So we have type name value in TTL. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the name here, let's just say the, the zone is, uh, zone's going to be this. Name is going to be thin DNS. Uh, and the type is string, so that's going to be A. I would assume so, yeah. Uh, TTL, five minutes. Sure. Which I think that is the lowest we can go. And the value is going to be, uh, let's say, you know, any arbitrary IP address that we can recognize afterwards. Yes. Sounds good. OK. Um, this is get records. And then we have set records, which I think we'll just log what this does. Uh, rex records zone. Okay. Um, and then we just pass in that provider. So that's already correctly named. Mm -hmm. We'll return an error. So can do if the update fails, uh, update. It's going to lock this error for now. Sure. Okay. Um, and then the zone, oh yeah, we already have that in a constant. We just need to pass it in. The IP address that we have here should be the same. Um, oh, actually, let's say we're going to update it to four um, so that you know it returns three. Uh, we say we want it to be four, and then that way, uh, yeah, that should work. So right. specify this, we have that. Verify that DNS is correctly. Yeah, we have all of these to do this done. Um, could you do the um, I notify watch thing with the go test watch? Yeah, of course. This is test update. Internal din DNS. Go. I think the clue is to be calling out depending on the record type. Some providers don't allow you to have certain combinations of DNS types for the same host. For example, if you have a C name, adding an A would delete the C name. Ah, yeah, that is a good observation. Thank you. Um, this might be the nuance. Uh, not enough arguments. Oh. 68. Uh, oh, did I mess this up? Uh, looks like 68. Oh, okay. I see. I forgot a parameter. Oh, yep. yeah. There we go. Okay. Cool. So what's it say? Uh, set records. Um, zone equals secure to net. Uh, we yeah. did not update the IP address yet. So yeah, That is not implemented yet. Right. So um, what we'll need to do here is uh, existing make uh, DNS of record, same length as existing. Oh, and this should be updated, of course. So we're just going to copy into updated from existing. Um, and then we're going to replace this with a loop. OK, so for the existing ones that we have, and say updated. Uh, Overwrite the because they're just struct fields. Like there's no clone necessary. So update the value. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is going to be yeah. So this is not a pointer type. So this is going to be a struct copy. So we are actually able to just say uh, rec value equals ip adder if we locate the correct record. Continue yes. if this is not the desired record. Because we don't have any filtering in here, right? The get records is for the entire zone. Um, so we'll need to filter this later. But we don't pass in the record that we're interested in either right now. So uh, this needs to go. Um, let's see what the test says. There we go. Passed. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it passes because it only logs, right? But what we can see is the uh, one twenty seven zero zero four. Right, that's what I meant. Right? Yeah, being updated. Um, so that's good. Um, what we can now test is uh, the scenario that we were uh, confused about earlier, right? So what happens if we do uh, unrelated? Yep. And we're gonna say it modifies both. If the record dot name is not equal, then DNS secure the map. Continue. So we have the filtering. Um, we'll need to factor this out afterwards. And what does test say? Um, we're only we're not we're oh. not putting. We need to put the the record back into the uh, the slice yeah, for setting, need, right? Update it. Um, so let's make this like so for simplicity. So the unrelated is still in there, unmodified. Um, no, it actually can't read this. Can you scroll a little bit? Like yep. add a couple lines? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so unrelated is in there with the correct IP address. The other one is updated. That is good. API tokens are scopable to zones. LibDNS even recommends it. Uh, for Cloudflare, okay. that is. Yeah, I, I don't know for sure what that is in reference to, but um, yeah, scoping the API token to a zone, definitely a good idea. Um, oh, yeah, if I did that and added a zone that we don't care about. Um, we can verify we can the behaviors. It, I don't think I can easily add a zone. That was the problem, right? Because I don't have a domain lying around that I don't need to use. Right. Um, OK, so wait, but um, actually, um, now we need to change this after all, because the previous thing was actually what we wanted to do, I think. Because now we, so we currently get the set records uh, in our callback for all of the records, right? But what we wanted is um, to only add it if it needs to be modified, so that um, I declare but not used. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So now we're only yeah, passing so in. Now the set records should only contain the one that we care about. Um, it's only contain the un. It's only contains the uh, unrelated right now. I think we inverted the logic there. Oops. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was just hidden behind your camera. So sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's the problem with the camera in this spot. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this is test update. Um, we could add another test that verifies that uh, if there's nothing to update, no set, like the set records call is either skipped invoked. entirely um, or at least with like a len of rex of zero. Right. Um, I don't know if it's better to skip it entirely. Maybe um, I don't know if the providers have tested their code under the assumption that you give them an, an empty Rex slice. I think it's probably best to skip it entirely just to save the network round trip, honestly. But and the API yeah. call in case your limits are low and you're. Do we know our IP address is v4? Depending on the answer, we also need to check type A or A A A. Uh, that is correct. Um, yeah, the IP address is v4 only here because for IPv6, um, it is more common to have a static network. Um, I want to say, like, that's the world I want to live in, at least for, for router seven, which is scope to fiber seven, um, I, I ISP connections. Um, that is the case. Like the IPv6 is static or, you know, actually it, it changes unless you request a static one. So, yeah. Um, but I don't know, like, you know, the, the concept of adding DIN DNS for IPv6 isn't, it's not so easy, right? Because, uh, the problem is that, uh, you have an entire network that has has been updated, right? So you would essentially need to like renumber all of these um, addresses that are within the network, right. which is like considerably more complex than just having a single IPv4 than DNS record. So I think for this stream, at least, we're going to start with IPv4 only. And then later on, if there is a need to actually update this, um, you know, if there are people who want to have an updated record, but not a static address for some reason, which, you know, it's, it's a combination that doesn't appeal to me, but we can always add it later. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So when I swapped my uh, modem out, actually, Charter gave me a new slash 56. So I had to renumber my DNS records, which was annoying. So I guess yeah. the solution there would be to give a prefix length, lop off that length, and then put in a new one. But it's uh, it doesn't need to happen today, of course. Yeah. Um, can you not also get a static IPv6 net? Uh, no, I'm on the residential plan. So <laughs> okay. it's uh, it's pretty silly. Like I, I thought it was static because it had not changed in a very long time, but it turns out it is. So Yeah. What jobs are configured in your CI/CD? Um, essentially, make test. Um, I don't think it's much more. We can open it up real quick. Let me just uh, finish the thought in this to do here. 
um, add a test to verify set records is not called when no updates are necessary. I'm going to grab water one more time. I'll be back. Okay, so this is the .travis.yaml. Um, so you can see that it has a couple of things. It checks whether the files are syntactically correct, so whether they can be parsed by GoFund. Then it checks whether there would be any changes if you do a GoFund, so it checks that the formatting of the files is correct. Um, it does a GoVet. Um, currently, we ignore the result of the GoVet because there are still a couple of vet errors, I think. No, I think actually um, Matt might have fixed them in his last uh, stream where he was working on Router 7. So maybe we can actually enable this now. That would be cool. Um, then we, um, the, the Travis containers that we're running in have IPv6 disabled by default. So we're turning that off and we enable IPv6. Then we're going to build all of the code. We're going to uh, do a go test with the race detector enabled in all of the internal tests. And then uh, we start the Docker build so that we get like the full environment uh, in which we can actually run our um, make test like integration tests, um, which is what is happening here. They're being run under Docker um, dash test. Dot v, so we get the verbose output. Yeah, that is that is all we have. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we should move this to GitHub Actions at some point, but for now it is on Travis. Does that answer the question, or uh, do you want like a different nuance or detail here? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I think one of the questions is how do we actually test this in the wild? Uh, if anybody has like, uh, <laughs> if anybody wants to like send us a, a, an API key for any of the supported libDNS providers with a test zone, that'd be cool. Um, but one thing that we can already do is the record name. Uh, so zone string record name and IP address. So we're just going to say record value instead of IP address. Um, record value. I have a test zone. Nice. Um, I don't know how to best send it to Matt, but maybe you already know. All right, I'm back. It's funny. Somebody, uh, somebody on my stream, the other week mentioned the OBS oven and you can feel it. My room here is probably five degrees hotter than the rest of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I am noticing the same thing. So I have like a degree, uh, display in my I3 status and it is reporting that the living room is 28 degrees right now. Uh, <laughs> and it was at least one degree Celsius cooler before we started the stream. <laughs> yep. I can check my uh, node exporter too, and I can see everything is uh, hotter. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> so, chat, if you all aren't running Prometheus at home, you should. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so I have in the meantime changed update to actually also take the record name um, and yes. rename IP address to record value. Um, so, this now kind of does what we want, I think, if you call it with the right parameters. Yes. Um, now we need a test zone. Um, Taren says that he has test zone. So maybe he can like send you the um, API key. Oh, cool. OK, um, yeah. I, I don't know for sure how we would actually like configure it. But I think at this point, what we want is actually the, the command uh, uh, folder um, with the binary. So we can actually run this interactively on the terminal and maybe you know set some environment variables that contain the API key that we then just pick up in our code so we don't need to share the key on stream. Yes, sounds good. Uh, Taryn, if you want to send that to me in a DM or something, I can put that on a, I can put that into my environment. I'll be paying attention to the uh, the Gopher Slack. Okay. Copy this, paste it here. Cool, thank you, I appreciate it. Finally, bin DNS. Um, updates, configured, DNS records, the current public IPv4 address, network interface, zero. Um, how do I actually wrap comments in VS Code? Is that a thing? Oh, I always just do it manually. I'm sure there's probably a smarter way. OK. Uh, let's do it like this then for now. Okay, so we should have a funk main here. 
Um, um, what we're going to do is, I always start out with like just a logic function, uh, log table, yep. error, then do fund logic. Um, and so now that, you know, if we just return an error out of here, it will be logged and we don't need to add these log statements here so that we can easily refactor whatever this does and, you know, refactor this either way, like split stuff out or put stuff in, et cetera. Right. As soon as you start having like multiple fatal Fs, it gets easy to leave one in in a spot it doesn't belong. Exactly. So that's why I get into the habit of only ever having one. Um, and then, you know, everything else is just like properly handled. I like the same idea. And also if you have to use something like a uh, standard error or standard in, uh, you can actually pass them as readers and writers and then parameterize that in tests. But yeah. Just quite um, nice. Yeah. I have done this before as well. Um, so if we do didn't ask an update, so we can now see it pulled in the, uh, import for the package that we just started. Right. Um, we can now see, we need a context, we need a zone, we need a record name, we need a record value. Oh, the IP address is still in there. That should be removed. Um, and then we need a provider. Um, okay, and we're just gonna do like this is current. So currently, this is just the uh, it's just the one shot version, no looping going on. Right. Um, actually, so let me go in here. I'm gonna find the I Cloudflare should... provider and uh, get the uh, get that initialized. Uh, one sec. It's in DNS test. Why did this not complain? Actually, though, did you not run the tests when I re did this refactoring? Oh no, sorry. I uh, I was uh, doing something else. I can start that up though. Cool. Uh, one moment. Internal. Didn't get us. Here we go. Use rewrap to wrap comments. Cool. Okay. Um, I had hoped that you know probably VS Code has a function for this, right? Um, every other editor I've used has a function to wrap lines. Oh, okay. So it's an extension. Cool. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I will. Uh, I'll check that out. Okay. Do we need it both if we're sharing? <laughs> I suppose I need to install it too. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, it might require re like restarting VS Code, so I was just going to leave it alone for this stream. I don't oh, think yeah, it, I don't yeah. think it's worth uh, it at this point. Yeah, I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So um, this at least tests. So what we can do here now is um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's see what we're going to do first. Um, okay. I think at this point what we want is a couple of things should be flags, like the zone. I'm just going to add to do for like all the help text because we can write them later. Right. Flag the parts here, and then pass in the zone like this, and pass in the record name. Ah. I can't spell get in to save my life here. Mind. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, I, so it's kind of funny because I have an 80 character uh, like bar in my editor because I hate uh, long lines of code. Yeah. Um, my rule of thumb for this is that whenever I'm constructing a struct, uh, I want each like field key and value on a separate line. I agree, especially because Go format makes it so nice. Yeah. So I have the zone available now as well. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, I'll put the API key in my environment. Code because the zone is one of the things that we'll need to have configured later anyway. I mean, all of these are going to end up in the same configuration surface, I think, which is probably just going to be like a little JSON file. OK, yeah. Uh, but for now, I think it's OK if we split this into things that people on the stream cannot see, which would be the environment variable, and things that we can, without any hesitation, add into the command lines, which would be these flags here. OK. So Taryn, do you care if we uh, do you care if we share your zone? And I guess the zone would be shared regardless, though. So. Yeah, I mean the zone name we'll need to query that yep. as well. Right. It needs to be public. Okay, so now I now have a terminal with the API key in my environment. So whenever we're ready to try something, we can do that. Great. Yeah, if you just do a go run here. Yep. CTX. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll fix that. Yep. Okay, it should work now. Okay. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think we need to specify the zone as well. So if I run it with the zone yes. Taryn gave me. Um, yeah, yeah, we definitely need to add both uh, the zone and the dash record flag. Right, so the record would be, would the record just be din DNS dot the zone name? Um, yeah, I think the record would be like the full name. Yeah. 
DNS, Dan DNS, right? And the zone yeah, yeah. would be opensnack.org. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, so I know that if, I don't know if this is Cloudflare, but if it is Cloudflare, oh yeah, it is, uh, the provider is. Um, I think the zones actually have an ID. I don't know if we can use the name here or if we're going to need to use the ID. Okay. It's a string at um, the moment, so I was assuming just the name, but we can we can find out, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, is this one of those things where I need to do like, there we go. Yeah, or just add the file name. Right. Okay, so I think Taryn mentioned on a chat that the permissions listed in LibDNS README don't work. So they're trying to figure out. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Live, uh, live debugging. <laughs> It's kind of funny how you, you do these things and like you think it's just going to work no problem and it, there's always some uh, some abstraction in the way of like ACLs. <laughs> yeah, I mean ACLs are in general the the stumbling block number one in many environments, right? That's very true. Yeah. One more time. So that is yeah. Don't have permission to list zones. Okay. You're gonna get a new order while you guys figure this out. Oh uh, yeah, go for it. How's everybody doing today? It's been kind of it's been kind of interesting doing a stream with another person. This has been a uh, very unusual but very fun. So hope folks are having a good time. Hope you're all enjoying this. Uh, I'm planning on probably doing another stream. I think probably not tomorrow, but probably Monday. It's a holiday here in the U.S. I will probably do a stream as well. But thank you all for hanging out. We appreciate it. All right. What's the status? Um... Uh, nothing as of yet, so I take it you're still working on something. Um, is there anything else we could do in the meantime? We could do some more code cleanup, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, we could... Um, uh, one of the more smooth pair programming streams I've seen. You work well together. Thank nice. you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I, have not, I don't have a lot of experience with code programming streams, but uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you guys uh, are enjoying this. Yeah, totally. Like, uh, you know, we, uh, we got this together, like, just kind of at the suggestion of a viewer anyway, so we're happy to, uh, happy to be doing this, you know? Yeah. Okay, um, so in terms of configuration surface, um, uh, you know, router seven has like all of these little JSON files. Yeah, um, it's a little bit hard for me to share these because um, they contain like a lot of internal details. But I think one of the files that I can share, um, let me just uh, prepare this actually, is uh, the port forwarding file, so you get a feel for how I'm structuring these. Oh, uh, by the way, we did not check record type, but only record name. Okay, so we can I can take a look at that really quick. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so we only want to, we only want to update a records, right? So equals a. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yep. Thank you. Good catch. Really cool pairing. I've been making dough for tomorrow. Sourdough pizza. Nice. Got myself a pizza oven. Excited to try it first time tomorrow. I'm so jealous. That sounds delicious. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, uh, have fun with that. It is a, a nice toy. For a moment here, I was concerned this error was dumping the API key, but this is something totally different. So that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, take a look at my screen here. Yeah. Um, this is uh, an example JSON file where uh, I'm specifying the port forwardings. So this is all going to be uh, translated into NF tables instructions. Um, and what you can see here is that I'm just like formatting these uh, JSON files. Like there is a, a function in the JSON package that will you know, print them out like this so they can be easily manipulated in a text editor. But aside from that, it's mostly just you know speaking description fields in the JSON struct, um, and then you know making it convenient for for a user to write these. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good call. Thank you for the uh, fix here. Oh shoot, it's not what I intended. I got my boolean logic wrong. Oh. And then forgot how to use my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, record name is not record name, or the record type is something else in A. Yes, yes. Because you could have different records for that name that are not A records. 
Yeah, I'm thinking at this point, um, we have the record name, the record value, and if we also add the record type to the signature, we might as well just add a record to the signature at that point, right? Yes, I would agree. Uh, so maybe maybe the best uh, uh, course of action here is to kind of re uh, to to like resemble Re the get records and the set records um, uh, signature, right? So we would have like context first, zone second, and then just a single record yeah. that we want to have updated. Um, and then it should be replaced if it already exists. I think that should be the semantics of this function. Sure. Okay. And then we're actually going to make it take the record. Um, this would be this would just be record. Just be lift DNS of record, uh, and then here, mm -hmm. record of name, record of actually, record of type not equals record hard of type, and then it's no longer hard coded. Right. And record of value. Okay. Um, now, of course, we'll need to update the test file. Is now. Uh, Type a value one twenty seven oh oh four. Uh, one thing, yeah, the the time, the TTL, uh, we're currently hard coded, so that's that's that'll need to be configurable too. But that will happen on the JSON layer. Mm -hmm. uh, so in here, this should work. We need to pass uh, the say. record directly to update. Uh, this, so it's, oh. it's named update, but the yeah, there you go. Oh, oops, yeah. That should be it. I use zone as type string argument to get records in 32. Parameter oh, order? Uh, zo oh, zone should still be a string, right? Yep, it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, it was it was, it was taking over the type of libdns record because there was no parameter type uh, listed behind it. OK. We're fixed uh, now. Just update this real quick. So Yep, go for it. So this is where we now hard code the type for now. Yes. And also the IP address, and we'll need to get this. Uh... Right, grab it from your configuration file or the current system state. Is this something you would grab from like a configuration file, or like how does router 7 handle this? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So the, the file that I just showed you, like uh, the port forwarding subjects on. Yeah. Uh, is on router seven canonically it will be in slash perm slash port forwarding stuff JSON for the permanent data partition. Uh, so that's where all of the config files are. Uh, some of them have subdirectories, like for example, uh, the DHCP 4D has a Lisa stuff JSON in the subdirectory for its state. I see. Um, so in DNS, I think it might just be perm DNS JSON because it's a small program. There's not a need for multiple configuration files. Um, so that's where I would start out. Right. And the good bit is that we can easily just make the path of flag with the slash perm slash dns.json be the default. Um, and we can override it for interactive testing if we want to. Right. OK, so the test passes, I think. Right. Um, yes. And our manual update still fails. Is that is that true? Can you try again? Uh, unknown oh. field IP dns slide 45 value. Yeah. Yep. Try this. I've got this. Uh, I've got this moved down a ways, but I can. Uh, yes, same error as before. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Um, one thing we can do in the meantime is, um, I think. Yeah, Taryn, no rush. We can always find something else to work on. But thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. Um, oh, I don't have a cancelable context actually in the uh, router seven code base yet. Um, don't necessarily need one either um, because there's not anything to clean up here in this program. So the, the cancellation, like the control C that you do to cancel the, the process, it doesn't need to know about it because it doesn't need to do cleanup. Yeah, all it would do is possibly cancel an in-flight HTTP request. So hmm. yeah, for this particular thing, there's nothing really fancy going on. 
Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we can punt that to later yep. when we actually need it. Okay. Um, yeah, so we could just totally do the JSON for the config, right? Um, yeah, sure. Be... Um, and then we can actually also, like, if we play our cards right, we can actually also add a test here on the command level. Indeed. Right? Um, so that we can then just you know verify that the uh, correct config file results in the correct calls. Um, and then that way we have a test on all of the different layers. Right. Sounds good. Cool. Let's do a bin DNS test.go here. I'm not sure how you would like to format the JSON, but if you uh, if you have an idea in mind, we can start writing the uh, the Go equivalent. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not like a thousand percent sure what you're asking, but I think you'll see what I mean. Okay, yeah, um, sounds good. Yeah, I was just uh, I, t I assume you're probably not one of those map string interface JSON people because that uh. That stuff is like the wild, wild west, you know? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Anonymous structs are my preferred way, or just, a, in this case, an exported struct or something. But Yeah. Um, so what we can do here is we can, like, um, let's see. Uh, if we were to replace this call here, um, so we could either arrange for a provider to be configurable and inject it, and then, like, redirect it like that. Yeah. But we already do test that then the NSN update actually works as expected in the other package. Right. So we don't need to do that. Um, we can just redirect the update here to a function callback that we control and then right. verify that called yep. with the correct parameters. Um, so why don't we actually get this uh, get this up and running for the code as it is right now, and then we'll modify it in lockstep. Yeah, sounds good. We just call logic. Um, so we're just going to do a function pointer for injection here, um, function variable rather. But uh, yeah, we should probably have like a state struct in the menu term. Um, what is the signature here? Can we easily copy and paste that somewhere? Maybe if we go to, oh, see, it can't jump to the definition here. Oh, maybe be some editing right here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Nice. A little bit annoying. I can't do that. Yeah, if there's like a compilation error, yeah, that's a, a nuisance for sure. Yeah. Oh, and then this jump as well. It's a little bit hard to navigate with all of these tabs um, and the little screen space. Okay. Um, this is a funk. Well, actually, I don't think we need this. Uh, I don't think we need the specific type because we can just do it like this. Yep. And then we'll just place this in the test. Yep. We're going to say update. Oh, but we need it here now. <laughs> okay. So this is a get the context zone record and provider. Mm. Shadowed. In fact, the uh, provider will ignore. And we're just going to do a lot of print up. They call with uh, update zone and record. That's all, right? Yeah, that is all. So record return. Actually, you can return an error here because we don't have our test logic implemented yet. Right. And then we're going to logic. Uh, if this returns an error, it's going to log that. OK. Um, uh, so we don't. We we're not exporting our record getter setter interface. Should I export that really quick? Um, no, I'm going to say no. Copy. Wait, does it not work without it? Also, oh, yeah. it's in a different package, right? It's in the internal. Yes, we will need to export this actually. Yes. Yep. All right, I'm on it. Yep, I'm on it. Uh, actually, I should probably do that with the type aware stuff. Cool. And then here I can just use uh, DNS or DIN DNS. Dot, yeah, I'd expect that to work. Okay, oh, that uh, was... not yet implemented. We're good. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, because logic now returns an error, and but it does log the call that we're making here. Yes. Okay, good. So now um, what we can see in the error message is that zone is still set to do, and the um, 
the, the, the name of the record is also set to do because that is our default flag value. Right. So now what we can do is we can just do the flag.z, um, which is like dummy zone. Um, so you like, work. you like the flag setting stuff? No. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, I, I, at this point, I would I would pass these as parameters because like once you're getting into like setting global state or like environment variables, like things just get tricky. Definitely. Uh, I just want to illustrate how this refactoring goes, right? Sure. Okay. So, um, we're doing a flag dot set. Um, why does it not actually? Why is it not reflected actually though? Um, your test is still your your watch is still running, right? Correct. Do this. Uh, it updates, but it still says zone equals to do. This returns an so error. Why? Is it possible it's returning an error? Oh, because I don't have the flags uh, defined at the point when I call flag dot set. So yeah, um, one thing I can do is this. Then, yeah, now it works. Um, yeah, see, this is the, these are <laughs> this is the sort of trouble that you run into. Um, yeah, <laughs> we do testing like this with global state and yes. flag pack. Um, okay, so we're gonna move this back here, um, and I think now it is really time to like do a proper uh, configuration thing. So yep. Um, why don't we do a um, a type, and we're gonna say Indian S record um, all of the struct fields that we are going to use with the json package are going to need to be exported because it uses reflection to find them right um, so there's a little stumbling block here to be aware of um, so let's see like okay um here's a question right like if we were to nest this properly like in terms of hierarchy we would probably enable users to configure a provider and then records underneath that provider um yes but, uh, if we want to do like the quick and dirty, which probably just stuff everything into one struct and then change it later as we need to change the nesting. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, we'll see. So the API token will get passed in anyway. Are there any other like, oh, only the API token. Nope, that's only... The only... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so instead of passing yeah. a provider, do you want to put like Cloudflare? Uh, hey, hey. Sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Mutex acquire. Uh, <laughs> do you want to pass a uh, provider as like, for example, just like Cloudflare API token for now instead of like parameterizing the provider itself? Or what would you prefer? Yeah, that's kind of the thing, right? Um, I think for, for JSON to be convenient here, um, we would need to add like multiple fields. Um, like, you know, maybe have like a Cloudflare substruct. Yes, right. Um, and we should probably move this into like a provider or a credentials sub flag or something. But yeah, anyway. Um, however, now, so this one we actually, like, we don't actually want this in the JSON file, right? Um, because we're going to pass it in with the environment variable. But maybe, um, well, sorry, the audio is so confusing for everybody. Um, we're going to need to find a different solution for next time. Um, the API token, okay, so. Uh, right, we want to override this actually from the environment variable, I suppose, and we can probably do this unconditionally so that it works with the. Um... <laughs> yeah, thanks, Emsa. Yeah, appreciate um, it. <laughs> so that we can do it um, with the testing here. So are you using FF for flag parsing. It also allows environment variable or config file with different priorities. That is correct. Um, but I'm not using FF, and for consistency, I don't want to start using it now. Um, the, we, we're actually going to go away from the flags um, entirely, right? This should only ever read in JSON, and for only ever reading in JSON, we don't need a separate package. Right. Uh, so, and then we have the record name. A quick, uh, quick clarification point. So, uh, did you briefly mention substruct in here? But um, I feel like you know we would we would need to duplicate the type anyway, so we could add our JSON um, annotations. You were going to say? Yeah, my apologies. Uh, quick clarification point. Did you mention you don't want to put the API token in a file? Because it's here in the definition now. Or Yeah, I know. It is in there. And I think it can go in there. But for our purposes, we're going to override it afterwards with uh, the, the token from the environment variable. Understood. OK. Um, that's mostly for us developing it interactively, right? Um, like in, in steady state setup, um, people are going to have like just a JSON file. Yep, understood. OK, so we have the record name. Let's say record name, uh, record type. So the record type is realistically just A at this point. So we're just going to leave it out. Maybe uh, in case quad A is ever necessary. Yeah, make record type 
customizable if non A is ever desired. Yep. Uh, record value is going to be IP address. Uh, record TTL for uh, for completeness. Uh, record TTL. Yeah. Um, I'm just I saying. Don't know if it can the time of duration like this. That's what I was going to ask. How does that marshal a JSON? Like, does that take the uh, like the three S format maybe? I don't know, man. Um, I think it might be safer to just do uh, record TTL seconds. Seconds, yeah. And I, I would specify the unit as well. Yeah, and then uh, convert it over uh, later on. Okay, so now we have a Dindian as record, so we can just say um, logic will just, like, you know, we'll just uh, inject this, right? I'm just going to say Dindian as record. Um, and then we're going to work on actually um, changing it so that it actually reads from file. Um, right. So this would be, um, I guess, just like hypothetically here. So this would be a fighter, and then if config Cloudflare. Yeah, cool. You'll do this. I'll do that. Yep, sounds good. Uh, speed. Yeah, and don't don't forget um, overriding it from the environment, right? Right. Yeah, I was I was going to for now just hard code. This is what I want now. say oh you're still editing on there that's fine yeah sorry um okay. i'm just gonna go back to what we had for before i don't think i i don't think it's worth dealing with this right now really uh, yeah um and then here we can just take the uh config dot record name uh and here I'm just gonna add a uh, to do use config dot record ptl right uh, and then we can remove the flags and remove the flag of parse, and uh, one more bit of global state is gone. Excellent. Yeah, I was I was getting very afraid when you were starting to set flags in tests. <laughs> I was like, oh no, we're gonna have like a hypothetical or a, a debate here on channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, okay, undefined zone. Um, oh yeah, because the zone is actually also. Oh, we ha we have entirely forgotten about the zone. Uh, yeah, so the zone, zone should be part though... of the config as well. Yeah. Okay. At the hacker news blog post. Yeah. Um, nice. <laughs> okay. What do the tests say? Um, not enough arguments in call to logic. Yeah, we're not passing a struct here right now. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So now we could totally do it here from the flags, right? Um, if we still wanted to have that config um, surface, but we don't. We don't need to. Um, so one thing we can do here. Um, okay, so we don't need the program to actually run, right? So uh, it is legit to just pass in nil for now. Um, we only need to test right now. So, okay, so the tests are actually saying what we want them to say, except for the zone, which we haven't set yet. And now that looks better. Okay. Um, you have the hardware designing. Yeah, PC Engine's board is where it's at. Those are great embedded devices. Yeah, I'm running the same one, actually. Um, it's kind of funny because I was talking to somebody, and they're like, oh, as soon as they make a Zen one, that'll be great. And I'm excited for a Zen one eventually, too, hopefully. But <laughs> it's not like a router needs to do a whole lot, but it would be nice for, like, my Nix OS builds to be faster. <laughs> <laughs> right. Are you building on the router? Well, I'm actually using my server as a remote build machine now, but for a while I was building on the router, and that was pretty tough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think the problem was that um, AMD sort of had like the the old platform and lineup of like APU series, right? Which are all of these embedded low power uh, CPUs. And then when they adopted the new Ryzen architecture, they just didn't have anything that would compare to that for the longest time. Yeah. So I think they're now only slowly starting to introduce new products that could actually be made here. Um, and then we'll see how long it takes PC engines to actually like, you know, um, get all of the porting done and all of the hardware design, et cetera, it might be a while. Yeah, totally. I mean, no rush, you know, from my perspective, like the, the demons, my router is running, like the CPU is very low utilization. Yeah. 
So exactly. Okay. Um, so the next step here, I think, um, is yeah, we can just verify that the the stuff that we put in here uh, is the stuff that we then actually receive in the call so that, you know, it's just exercising the configuration surface, essentially. Right. Uh, what we can do here now is um, if we're going to do it properly, uh, if the zone is got and what we want is config.zone, um, we're going to say um, update unexpected zone, but this one, that, got one. Okay. Uh, we can do the same thing with the record name. Um, and this be, oh yeah, because this is record name, it's got config.record name. Okay, this is very mechanical, but um, yeah, this is what we need. And then in here, it's going to say no. Um, actually, we can also just make this return errors here instead of calling t.rf directly. Right. Which would be a little bit nicer. And then we're testing it in a better way. Yep. OK. The test says OK. That is good. Yeah, sometimes uh, when you pass the t into closures, like you can get really weird behaviors too. But I think in this particular case, it's going to be fine. Uh, yep. Yep. Um, the, the, the case where uh, it causes trouble is when you have a go routine that uh, holds onto a T and then actually calls something like t.fatal. Right. Uh, because right. that passes the internal model of how you should be using the testing package. Cool. Um, so actually, what I, think I, what I think I've run into in that particular case is if you have a test that creates a subtest and the subtest invokes a function and then that function actually has the outer T scoped into it, I think that will also cause a problem, even if there's no concurrency involved. Um, yeah, there there is like the additional gotcha here that if you have subtests uh, that are parallel, you need to actually wait for them um, at the end. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, how is our situation looking with regards to the testing zone? Is it still permission denied? Um, oh yeah, so now the flags won't actually work. <laughs> um, we destroyed our testing path. Right, yeah, now we need a file, actually, so. Excuse me, yeah, that is correct. Um, so, what are we gonna do? Um, yeah, we, we're gonna wanna, wanna have multiple of these DNS records, actually, um, and then the config file, so we probably need an additional, what we can do is. I think it's usually nice to have like a top level struct with like fields, that way you can add more things later on versus having a top level array which is then harder to uh, add fields to. I, I do agree, and uh, if we uh, go back to the um, port forwardings, actually, uh, that is exactly what I've done Same here. thing, There's yep. Which is a slice or an array in, in JSON terminology. Right. Uh, so yeah, the, the in fact, uh, config is a struct, and we're going to have... Records. So just records, in the its records. Uh, I'm just going to say records. Yep. Because the file is already called the DNS. I think the DNS part is applied by the name of the daemon and everything. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, but in this case, it's about the config file, right? But it's also already in there in the name. So. Yeah. Okay. So then we're going to say, uh, we're going to read a file. Um, this should be, this should come from flags, actually. So we're going to have a config file is a flag.string. Uh, also going to split this up into multiple lines. Default to perm thin DNS of JSON. Uh, gonna write a nice message here later. Parse the flags. Uh, read from the config file. So now we have like a couple more error handling statements, but it's yep. really not too bad. So I'm just going to give in here. Um, unmarshal um, our parameters again. Which one goes first? Why does it not show? Like when you need it the most. Uh, <laughs> okay. Unmarshal. Data and then the interface. Uh, so data is what we read from the file, and then config is what we're unmarshaling into. And then we're just going to say config.records. And 
here we will need to change this uh, to be just records for the time being. This makes it a little bit nicer to test. Um, as soon as we add anything else, we'll need to refactor this to be like a full config chart. But for now, this is okay. Um, oh, you already prepared the yep. thing as such JSON. That's nice. Um, and then here, I think the uh, logic. Oh, the, yeah, this now needs to be records. So. Add out to slice. And this is no longer going to be a pointer. Uh, test say undefined config. Uh, what did you say? That? Fifty-five. Uh, it is now a slice instead of a single record, so we need to iterate them. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, indeed. Uh, or perhaps just right now check the first one because we're assuming there's only one. For sure. Uh, Quick and dirty, and then we fix this right yep, up here. Exactly. Cool. So now you can try running again, see what ah. happens. Uh, uh, that did we not pipe in that flag? Pile, oh, sorry. I was looking for dash C. I wasn't even thinking about it. Yep. Yep. Uh, whoa. Why? Uh, Config. Five. Uh, is this. It's because of my. Try without the dash dash, but yeah. do give go run a file name, uh, but do the file name before the parameters. So do go run main.go and then all of the parameters that we want to give it. Ah, okay. So go run main.go, right. It's actually didn't dns.go, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. I usually name these main.go, so sorry. Um, didn't dns.go. Oh. Oh, hey. Uh, I think we have Doing credentials. Something. Yeah, this is uh, interesting. Uh, sorry if there's any audio problems on my side. So the air conditioning is running and it's in that closet right there. So it might be kind of loud. So I am hoping that uh, perhaps OBS or whatever is gating the noise. But uh, my apologies. Oh, okay. S there's uh, extreme cuts up for seconds from time to time. Hmm, interesting. Um, for me, everything is super smooth. Yeah. Um, I do hear Matt all the time. Um, I should have enough bandwidth and, and computing power to push my own stream. Um, and I think it worked fine when I was streaming alone yesterday. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's much we can do about it anyway, but uh, it is nice to to report if it works for you or not. So thanks. Yep, thank you. Uh, it's worth noting too, so the multi-stream, if you go to the upper right hand uh, side of the panes, there's a little reload button. So sometimes Twitch will desync audio and stuff. If you do reload mm -hmm. that pane, it might fix it, so. That's a good point. Uh, cool. So we got something that appears to be working now with whatever Terran set up. So, yeah, cool. Uh, so why don't you do a um, so okay? So wait. So in the dindns.json, we just have the record name set to dindns.opensnack.org. Correct. Um, that record does not seem to be in there, right? So if you do like a um, dig plus trace, so that you do a re-resolve um, of that record uh... dash t capital A, and then just dindns.opensnack.org. Okay, so it currently resolves to nothing. This is uh, roughly what we expect. Okay. Um, okay, so doo -doo -doo. what are we going to do here? Um, the logic, so we should be updating it to 127.0023. So this indicates that um, either our zone indicator is wrong in the config file um, or the record name. Oh, one thing I think is that um, there might be a logic bug in our DinDNS also. Um, that we haven't thought about yet. Um, let me pull this up here. Because currently what we do is we only ever update an already existing record. We never add a new record. That's true. Um, yeah, so this is not, this would be a new record, actually. Yeah. So if we didn't find anything to update, what we're going to do is we're just going to update the record that we were given. Yep. Sounds good to me. That is Uh, Can you run it again? So I, I'm trying to think this really quick. So when updated, so that's going to copy. Oh, so the length will be zero. Okay, so if there's nothing in the loop that matches, right. Okay, yeah, let's run it again. Yep. Updated. Okay, nice. It says okay. updated. Yep. Um, can you do the dig? Yep. Yeah, nice. It's in there at the very bottom. Excellent. Okay, yeah, there we go. Hey, first DN yeah. DNS. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, 
So one thing that we can now do is um, actually run it again, please. So we yep. just know that it actually also updates. Uh, not the dig, but the... Oh, running. right. You just change the address? Yep. Okay, running. Updated DNS uh, 127, 127. Okay. Uh, now we have two. Uh, now we have two A records. This is not what we wanted. No, not at all. <laughs> okay, so it's good that we tested it, but yes. um, how do we resolve it? Uh, hmm. Because I mean, strictly speaking, it is a legit scenario, right? There are circumstances where you would want to have multiple A records. It's just this is not one of them. And how do we express this in the libdns Yeah, yeah. So set records mentions that will either overwrite or let me look back at the base docs for this. Hooray round robin. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the DNS so much, um, this is this scenario where you have multiple IP addresses for a single DNS record is called round robin based on the uh, selection that clients are you know, asked to do. Not all of them necessarily do. Some of them just always choose the first record as a returned. But most of the DNS servers and the clients actually also um, shuffle these around before they connect so that it's a cheap form of load balancing. There is set and append in libDNS. Yeah, um, but what we're currently seeing is append, and what we're calling is set, right? So it may create or overwrite records, or depending on the record type, delete records to maintain parity with the input. So does that is our input correct? So. Well, I mean, the only input that we're giving it here is uh, the updated record, right? Or actually, wait. I don't think that's true now because we had, we had the record from the previous run, right? Uh, can you run it again? See yep. what it says. Uh, 400 record already exists. Oh, well, this is good. Um, what's it say in setting? Um, it actually has multiple in there, right? Yes. So it does. that might be the problem. Why does it have multiple in there? Oh, because we already have multiple ones existing and then updates both of them. Whew. We made um, it can we we could ask Terran to remove them in, from the dashboard or we could write code to do that. But the one thing that I'm not quite clear on yet is why did it ever add a second one to begin with? Right. Right. I so um, I, I was wondering if that was like a bug in our implementation here. Um Maybe, but it's not clear to me yet. Yeah, no, me either. Um, one thing we could do is we could deduplicate based on record names so that we only ever have one record for a given name. Yeah. That could be another to-do item. And in fact, so now I'm wondering whether we need to range through the existing ones at all. Oh, I think we wanted to do this so that we could um, exit out early uh, in case nothing needs to be updated. But we could still do this and always just unconditionally pass the uh, record that we're given to be updated, right? Yeah. So we could just say um, to do exit early if everything is up to date. Right. And instead of updated here. And save the API call. And here. Yep. So save the API call. Um, we're going to do. Update is going to be a slice of libdns.record with just the record that we have gotten passed in. OK, try running it again. Yep. A record with those settings already exists. OK, so how do we fix that? <laughs> um, that might be a problem if you're charged based on API calls like AWS. Um, no, no, I think. I'm not sure if you're misunderstanding. I mean, we are trying to address this problem, right? We're trying to save the unnecessary API calls. Um, so how do we fix this issue that an A record with those settings already exists? Like, why wouldn't uh, libdns update these for us? I'm not sure. Should we uh should we range over these and uh, clean up this output a little bit so we can like read more clearly like just the data we care about? Um, the existing ones, you mean? Yeah, so we can just check and see like which records are there that we would we would impact. Sure, sure, sure. yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, so if the record is not equal to the record name or the type, continue. Matched uh, percent plus fee. 
So roughly something like this. Right, so there's our two records that already exist. Yep. Oh, you know what, Michael? This might be that ID thing we were talking about, right? Oh, yeah. So I think so the problem is here is that we, we need to pass it with the same ID. Sorry, we just talked all over each other. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, so there was, like, already, uh, there was actually a point in, in doing the iteration over the existing records, which is to carry on the ID. Yes. So we, we do need to capture the ID. We need to set the ID according to... Uh, whatever already exists. So I would guess either the first or last one we find. Um, assuming we only want to update one A record at a time right now and not multiple. Yeah. Um, okay, so how about this? Um, Taryn, can you in the dashboard please delete both of these records for us so that we can start with a clean slate? Um, and we got a link to some code. Let's see here. I mean, the to-do is still relevant, but I think we're going to do it down here. And then here, um, but actually checks old records if ID is empty. Yeah. Oh. And our ID is empty. Both are deleted now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we need this again. We actually can probably just not give it a length in. That's probably okay. Um, okay, so we're going to say updated is append updated. Oh, and we want to modify the, the ID record. to match value to the oh, the ID value. Yeah, the ID will already be in here, right? Because we're going to append to updated the record that we got from the provider. Um, and we're not going to break out of this loop, right? So we only take the first. I see. Okay, yeah. Then we'll need to reinstate the check that we had before. Um, and we're going to say updated equals append updated. Well, actually, if it's length zero, we can actually just leave it like this. Yep. So that would be, you know, this is a brand new record versus an existing one. Exactly. Yep. Um, oh, and maybe this is, uh, that's, that, that is probably why, like, how the Cloudflare package distinguishes between updating an existing record and adding a new record, right? Uh, mm -hmm. based on the ID. Right. Because I think so you and I were both thinking that the zone was the... Sorry. <laughs> I think you and I were both thinking the zone was the unique part, but it was actually the ID field we had long forgotten about, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think um, this might have been this might have been why we end up with two records. Anyway, yes. um, yeah, run now, please. Yep, you got it. Okay, okay we now have a record. Updated. Okay. Um, why well, don't you just do an update again, see what it does. Okay, you don't want to change the IP? Uh, no. Yep. Record already exists. So does that so mean... So is... I'm not sure this does the right thing. If the ID exists, it always tries to create a new record. Why, though? I mean, that, that seems like a bug in the cloud thing, right? Yeah. I guess for now we could we could wallpaper around this with a, uh, you know, looking for HTTP four hundred. I mean, yeah, but will it also change the value of the record? So Terrence, think... lived in us, but yeah, I think so too, right? I mean, we could try and have a look at it, right? Um... Um, Cloud for the provider. Definition. Get records, and records, delete records. Yeah, so I guess what I'm seeing here is that since the ID is not empty, it's going to skip over the logic. It's just going to attempt to create record no matter what. So we're actually getting the raw response from Cloudflare that says HTTP 400. So I'm not sure if this is like a libDNS problem. Like, I guess it, it could be potentially, but we could also just work around it, at least for the time being. So wait, so set records, if we look at the implementation here, it ranges over the records, right? It checks if the record ID is not empty. Not empty. Um, if the ID is empty, this is what it does. But in our case, the ID is not empty. And then the code says record doesn't exist, which that is not correct, right? <laughs> yeah. It does mean to say if the record ID is non-empty. No. 
the record might already exist even if you don't know the ID yet. So then it tries to fetch the ID for you. But so it feels like a third branch might be missing here, right? Yeah. I think if nothing else, we should send some pull requests to like, uh, you know, clarify some of the documentation and just, I guess, verify what the intent is, right? Because after the old record checked in, if it does not exist, what? I think there's a typo in that chat message. Um, I feel like there's an if clause that's missing. Yeah, I think so too. Um, do we want to try and, and figure this out or? Um... Mm -hmm. Oh, we're already uh, well over the three hours actually. So how do you feel? Do you want to like, Try and try and try and fix that lip DNS package or no? Uh, I think we could probably go for like another maybe like half hour or so would be good. Yeah. But once you get to like the four hour mark, I, I tend to find I get like kind of like you know zoned out. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So we could try and fix we could try and fix the lib DNS thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to open it as well? I have it open on my stream. Yeah. Totally. Uh, how do you, let's see here. So does router seven have vendoring or no? Nope. Um, so in this case, um, I would recommend you use the go hack tool. To yeah. Install. It's been a while since I've looked at that. I'll have to, oh shoot. Uh, yeah. Just in your, like in the terminal that you have open here, just enter go hack, um, github.com slash liptns slash cloudflare. Enter. Yeah. Should be good to go. I don't know if I've had this installed for a while. So okay. one sec. Ah. So I think, you know, because we talked about this earlier um, with the go.mod changes that were intentional or unintentional, like the thing that you just did, like running go get to install a program within another project that already has a go module, I think that modifies go.mod. Yeah, I think it does too. That go mod tidy would clear out later. I always forget about that. Uh, so what's the, am I missing an argument here? So go um, hack. Oh, no. Oh, um, go ahead, get. Do go hack help. First, okay. um, I think we're just using like a verb for this. Uh, get undo status start hacking a module. Yeah, get get is what we want. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, so now, if you opened up the uh, so that path. Uh, yes. Um, the problem is now is we're outside of our shared VS Code session. Yeah, you will need to open it up in the other VS Code, I believe. Can you do that? Uh, there we go. Are you able to get into this tab? Uh, wait. Can you make a change to it? Looks like that didn't do anything for you. I do see your change. Oh, sweet. Okay, there we go. I guess we're good then. This looks funny on my screen. It says uh, tilde external and then like a, looks like a git ID and then client.go. Oh, that's uh, that's wild. Um, I'm getting the actual path of my file system. So. Okay, well, um, maybe this is because like this, this is like, it leads you outside of the uh, root of your of our shared session or something. Right. You should add folder to workspace. Oh yeah, maybe. Um, maybe that is necessary for VS Code. How do we do that actually? <laughs> I don't this, know, man. This is where we find out the, the limitations of what I know about. Uh, let's see here. So file, add file. Hey, there we go. Um, hmm. All right, one sec. Yeah, speaking of, let me... Uh... <laughs> I don't trust... I don't, I don't trust... Uh, long, but, um, actually, like the, uh, the PlayStation that I use uh, for, for my background image... Turn off. <laughs> 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 Power save. Nice. So there seems to be a timer that I've missed. Uh, let's see. Oh no! What did I? What did I modify in this file? I have no idea. I think it's fine. Okay. Uh, yep. Oh wow! What did you do? You ended the current collaboration session. Uh, maybe adding the folder to the workspace did that. I can. Okay, let me start another one. Starting yeah. and invite contact. Oh God, sign in again. The, the, the whole sign in experience is so terrible. Like, yeah, it's pretty moment. bad. I don't know why you've had to sign in like ten different times. Yeah, that's uh, that's strange. 
Oh shoot! Did I just miss that prompt? I think I might have. <laughs> um, oh no, I don't think there was one. But did you? Is the URL the same? Uh, yes. Uh, no, no. Let me send it. I'll drop it in our chat really quick. Uh, yeah. There you go. Thank you. It is different. So VS Code pops up these little boxes down on my like basically my uh, lower part of my screen. I sometimes don't notice them, so it's a little unfortunate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just make sure this still works okay sign in but then it doesn't do anything it's terrible okay um let me do like the let me do the full thing here so for weirdly enough this needs to open firefox to open xtg open again (laughs) that sounds about right (laughs) (laughs) i mean you've got your nested x server magic going on yeah right like Firefox was never in the loop here. I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> it's probably set as your default browser in some ridiculous registry somewhere. <laughs> hey, yeah, there we go. I remember telling Chrome that it should be the default browser here. So I don't know. I don't know what it does. Yep. Okay. Uh, this looks good. I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. I can see you do, doing things. Okay. Excellent. Cool. Um, so you are now in the DNS test. Um, yeah. Why don't we go into the Cloudflare? Um, why don't we start with just adding a print message here so that we can uh, see that our cloud modifications are taking effect, um, and then we'll try to make it work. So do we want to go to the provider code we were looking at, um, the set records? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just at the, like, after line 133, uh, just print out the record. That will give us something to work with for debugging and yep. so verifying that you know, everything is OK. Cool. Okay, so there's our there's our A record we're attempting to set. Nice. The ID is not empty, so. Yep. So uh, this this zone info. What is this? Should we compare against? Get zone info. Uh, print it. Let's print it. See what. Yeah. It, no, wait. Can we print it? Uh, let's go to definition. I just wanted to make sure there's no like leak in here. Oh um, yeah, right? totally. Uh, ID name. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of information in here. But I mean, one thing we can do is we can just print the ID and name fields. Yes, Put those be those should be safe. Yep, we can do that. Uh... And I still wonder if our zone is actually correct, right? Okay, I guess we'll find out, right? Okay, so you see that we have the zone ID, right? And yes. yeah, I was, I was, I guess I was just confused if we can use opensnack.org as an alias for that ID, because I think I've always used the actual ID, and I just wasn't sure that names work as well. But I think they do. Yeah, I'm honestly not sure. If you want to be like a thousand percent, you could just plug and play or uh, copy and paste this uh, uh, zone ID into the JSON file, right? Yeah, totally. Where is that file? Let's give that a go. Uh, okay, it requires, so this is back to the error we had before, so I'm pretty sure this is not right. Ah, right, yeah, no, you're right. Cool, okay, it's good to know. It's good to verify this. Right. Uh, can you run it again, just so that we're sure that yes. you know, we're, we're, we're before? Okay, yep. cool, cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm still having a hard time interpreting what exactly the contract is here with this API, right? Yeah, same here. Like, I'm trying to figure out what they wanted to express, right? Yeah. So you're saying the record might already exist, even if we don't know the ID yet. Uh, That is correct. So then they're getting DNS records. Um, What are the parameters here? They have context, zone, rec, match content. Match content, interesting. Uh, We should probably learn what that is. Oh, that is a parameter for the Cloudflare API. Okay. Um, how do I actually go back uh, after going to definition? Oh, I used the back button on my mouse. Huh. Yep. Um, today I learned. Thank you. Um, 
I guess it makes sense given that it is a browser. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like a Chromium instance or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we have get DNS records. We get a bunch of matches. These are Cloudflare DNS records. And if we have any, it ranges through them and it does an update record. And it does an update record and it converts the record to Cloudflare record. What is this? Oh, okay. Just the internal like, representation. All the fields over. Yeah. But then wait, so where does the the ID that comes in is taken from the libdns.record. So this will still call update record with an empty ID. So the ID Which, the ID was mentioned in the libdns documentation though to be the provider provider specific information. So in the case of Cloudflare, it appears to be some sort of like hash or UUID. Oh wait, see, this is update record. So it has old rec and new rec. So I suppose as long as match the, the old rec contains the ID, it will locate the record and then just replace the fields from the new rec. So does this imply that we don't want to set the ID? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I mean, oh, wait. Right, so I mean. So then it gets them and it updates them if it finds them. I find I it confusing. I would think that when you're setting a record with the same ID, it would overwrite. But I think in this particular case, it might be that you pass it without an ID and it assumes you want to update it. But yeah, I, I mean, I still can't understand under which circumstances you would pass in an ID and not want to update that record. I agree. Yeah, that, that is confusing <laughs> to me as well, because typically that's how like any kind of like update in an API works is based on like the primary key. Yeah. Um, and then otherwise it says record doesn't exist, create it. Um, oh, and that's because it has the fall through here. So um, like if there are no matches, like if to get DNS records doesn't work, then it creates it. Yeah. So that means that if we pass in an ID already here, we're not going to hit this code path and it will always create it. And that is how we ended up with the second record. Yeah, that seems wrong. That seems wrong to me. Yeah. Taryn agrees. If you provide an ID, you definitely want to update it. Yeah, I would I would agree with that assessment. So I think it's, I think it's worth opening an issue about this at the very least. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, but then let's think a little bit about whether we could change our code. Like if we remove the rec.id, we would still like it would still do a get DNS records. It should still locate it and should actually update it. Yeah, and that's what I'm thinking. So like I think if we remove the ID from our own code, it might actually work just fine. Okay. Do you want to give it a shot? Yeah, totally. Um, let me find the file we ran again. Uh, rec value. No. So the the rec value we actually want to clear here, right? Is that what I'm seeing? Uh, a rec. We want to clear rec ID to force an update. Yes. Yes, you're correct. And then we probably want to annotate that with the bug that we're about to file. Yes. Uh, before I write this, let's verify this hypothesis. So if I run the code right now, what happens? Okay, it was updated successfully. Uh, so let's let's change the IP address and try again. Yep. Um, One twenty-eight. There we go. Okay, so this is this is it. It's the ID being uh, empty that triggers the update path. So I would agree that is confusing behavior. We should file a bug. So. Uh, if you'd like to do that really quick, I think I'm going to get some more water if, for just a moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get some water. I'll be back in a sec. Okay. Any questions in the meantime? Uh, for those of you who are uh, who have joined after we started, um, so what we're doing here is native thin DNS support for the Router 7 project, which is a home router that was written entirely in Go. Um, the native thin DNS support is just you know very standard stuff. Um, if you have like a, a DNS zone at a provider such as Cloudflare or any of the others, um, and you would want to use a, you would want to have a DNS record that always points to your public IPv4 address, then that is what we are accomplishing here right now. Um, so far, we have uh, implemented a little test for the libdns packages that we're using here um, for our code that does an update. Uh, we've written the main program that actually loads the JSON config from disk um, and then triggers an update.
Okay, one thing that we can do is um, we can do the if record value is already record value in this return. Um, because currently, so update is being called once per record. So if the record is located and is already up to date, uh, we just return nil and exit early. Uh, we probably want to add like a little log message, at least for debugging. Um, probably not in the later stages because this is an internal package, shouldn't log, but for debugging, it's handy. Um, exit early record update and uh, record value has we're gonna print. Welcome back. Yep, I'm back. Uh, so I just changed, uh, I just added this, the exit early if everything's already up to date. Sounds good. And I did a quick recap of what we're working on. Record should be created rather than updated. This behavior is confusing. Oops. This behavior means that we clear the ID to force update by the zone name. Do you have a bug open for this yet? Nope. Okay. Um, no, I was busy recapping the stream. Uh, okay, excellent. So we're good together. Uh, cool. Okay. So should I file it or? Oh uh, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Since ultimately you're the one who's gonna need to use this, you know? Yep, yeah, fair enough. Okay, so here's a cool trick for uh, uh, GitHub users. So um, you can see that I want to refer to like this block of code, right? Because like this is where uh, this is where the the issue lies, right? So this is what we need to read to understand uh, where we're coming from. So I've clicked on line 134. Um, what I can now do is uh, like if the code changes in the meantime, uh, this link will no longer be updated, uh, or it will no longer point to the thing that that I wanted to point to. So I can press the Y key. You can see that it has added the, the blob here into the URL. So now this is a permanent link and will always point to this particular line. Um, and the next bit is we can actually change the hash in the URL too. So it has L134, which is the line that we start referencing. We can do L158. Um, and now you can see it actually highlights this entire block. So now if we plug this into the GitHub issue, you can see that it actually includes this entire block and we can just browse it in line, which is super convenient. That's awesome. I had no idea actually. I, I knew about the uh, I knew about trying to go find the hash, but I always did it a different way. That's nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, it looks like this part of the code. Um, yeah. So so how do we phrase this? So the the code currently, if the ID is empty. Uh, oh yeah, the ID must currently be empty for the code to update anything. Um, I think that is the, the most succinct description of the problem. Uh, currently, the records ID must be empty for it to be updated. It seems like the opposite of what one would want in that scenario. In passing in an ID, I would the record uh, referenced by that ID to be updated. Uh, can clarify if this is a logic bug or intentional? Um, I think this is an okay start for this issue. It's not like a thousand percent clear. 
But you know, given that this is on stream, I think we can start with this. And then uh, if Emma Holt has any questions, you can always just get back to us. Yeah, I agree. I think it's good to start somewhere. And I think that we're, we're explaining the behavior we saw versus the one we expected to see, which ultimately is pretty important for a bug report, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, libdns slash cloudflare slash issues slash one. Uh, you can reference that in the code now. Um, and uh, I can follow up on this later. Yeah. And add a link to the stream as well and more in context on the code of where then I'm going to push. Yep. Thumbs up emoji already from Taryn. He's on, he's on it. <laughs> I guess if the Cloudflare employee is confused, then uh, <laughs> in theory, we've got, a, we've got a solid argument on our side, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so what's the next step? We are at uh, three hours 40 roughly. So um, maybe it's time that we actually like um, bundle up all of this pending work that we have and put it into pull request. Um, wait, so, or do we want to try and finish it? So let's think a little bit about what still needs to happen for this to be something that we would feel comfortable committing. Um, I think if we, if we just go through it again, we can find all the places where we currently hard code something, right? So the dindns.go, this is our main binary. Um, we can actually just write a little help message. Um, path to the JSON configuration. Um, yeah, good enough, I suppose. Um, we don't have like a proper help site for it with examples or anything. So right. this will have to do. Um, then we should totally get the IP from the interface. Um, that is easy enough to do. Um, let's see if anything else needs to be doing as well. Oh yeah, the, the record TTL. Um, that should be a, an easy thing to fix as well um, because we can just um, do the time conversion here, right? Yeah, it's just an integer in seconds, so just do times time dot second, and you're done. It's converted to a duration at that point. Exactly. Um, so I think we need to cast it though, um, or is it actually is it is it? Um, well, we'll find out. So config until seconds time second. Um, is your test thing running? No, wait. This will actually not complain. Can you do the go run? Yes, I can do the test thing. Uh, one sec. Uh, no, no, the go run, I think. Oh, because right. This is in the main. Yep. Invalid arguments. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we need to um, do this, right? And then it should no longer complain. Can you do it again? Yeah, sorry. I was trying to see if I could fix the, uh, the background noise really quick, but it's probably not worth it for this point in the stream. But uh, okay. yeah, looks like it works. Yep, nice. Um, Right. I think um, the, yeah. Oh yeah, so we should probably also do the looping. Loop over the records. Right. Uh, this actually we've already done, right? The API token. Oh no, wait, you meant uh, using it. Using, using the config one. file, yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose we're at the point now where we could probably stop using the environment variable, but then we can't test it anymore for today. Exactly. But. Um, so for easy testing, we should probably have like an IP address parameter, yes. um, but we're actually getting it from the interface. Uh, we'll need to implement that functionality. Right. <laughs> Most important part is setting real value. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so let's do that, right? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> um, do you want to uh, give this a shot or should I? I'll give it a shot really quick. I, I think I might've found the setting that uh, somebody's referring to. I'm gonna see if I can uh, cut out the AC noise. Okay, cool. <laughs> of course, it stops just now. Well, no, the AC stopped, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I'll, I'll set a filter for negative 20. Okay, so now we have a noise gate filter. Uh, so in theory, no more issues with that. Um, okay, so I just uh, was browsing like my uh, proof of concept for this um, that I was running up until now, which is you know Cloudflare specific. So that's why I wanted to get it. Uh, generalized and, and built into router seven proper. Um, so I have this little helper function which gives us the um, IPv4 address or an error from the interface that we specify. Um, so we can just use the net.interface by name, uh, give it that interface. If there is an error, just um, return. 
Um, oh, so you're not going to read it from the, so you are going to read it from the interface itself and not the, I, I thought you'd mentioned earlier that all this was stored in like the file system. And I was curious, like if you were trying to avoid Netlink for some reason, but I think in this particular right. case, yeah, the standard no. library is fine, you know? Yeah. Um, so the um, the um, the IP addresses is, is okay. So everything that goes into the IP address configuration is actually stored on the file system, right? So the right. Uh, uh, for example, the DHCP four lease that I get from my upstream provider um, that is on the file system. But then the net config D actually interprets all of this, applies it, and then I just want to read the result of what it has applied, right? So that's why I'm querying the interface directly. I see. Um, okay, so I think that makes the most sense. To modify. Uh, if you were to modify the state in the middle, right? Like if you were to manually configure an IP address, um, that should be reflected, right? Like if you decide, oh, DHCP is broken right now and you're going to stop the DHCP for a client and just configure a static IP address, um, that should still be reflected. I see. I was kind of wondering if this was like the uh, like the NixOS philosophy of like everything is declarative and you should leave it alone. But like, I wasn't sure if you had allowed like, uh, you know, configuring addresses manually, but it probably makes sense to be able to break the glass at some point, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, in general, I try to like query things from where you would query them. So if you do like an if config or an IPA command uh, to list the the addresses, um, the program should do the same thing, right? Right. If config, okay. yeah, no more if config for me. I actually uninstalled it from my system. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Um, I'm not sure if I have uninstalled them actually, but I am in the habit of using the others. Um, I have noticed that on uh, Arch Linux, for example, the uh, netstat command is no longer present. So you need to use the SS command as a replacement. Yeah, and netstat's the one I use most often anyway. So uh, netstat would, you know, SS actually has a lot of the same flags. It's just, I find it's a little bit wider so it's a little bit more annoying to read, right? Yeah, well, it is flag compatible actually with the flags that I usually use. So I can literally, like, sometimes I'll enter like my netstat command line and it'll command not fun. I just replace netstat with ss and it just starts working. Yeah, totally. Okay, so um, if this is not an IP address, we can continue. If the IP address is. Everybody's not favorite, an... everybody's favorite Go API. <laughs> Or what'd you say? Oh, this this API is kind of my nemesis, the whole 216 and 24 thing, because it just gets oh, yeah. confusing to keep track of. Like so uh some of the some of the tail scale folks created a package called NetEdder, which is kind of like an alternative IP address thing. I've been using that in some of my projects and helping uh, contribute to that too, which has been pretty fun. But cool. Um yeah, I don't know what the status of that package is. I saw that Brad announced said uh, when it was fresh. Um, but I haven't checked back to see how it's progressing or, you know, if there's any sort of stability guarantees or anything like that. They recommend not using it at the moment. I'm using it in core red just because I don't mind updating my code if it breaks, but that's just me. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so, so this is going to, quickly... this is just going to assume that the, you're only going to have one IPv4 address, right? I mean, I, I'm trying to think of like, is it even possible to have multiple V4 addresses on an interface in any significant way? Like, I think so. Um, I think you can, like, for a while, you would need to create these alias interfaces in Linux yes. to have mobile IPv4s, but I don't think this is required anymore. And I think one of the significant differences between ifconfig and IP is actually that IP can show you these multiple addresses, whereas ifconfig will just not show them. Right. Maybe they've actually changed it in later versions of ifconfig, but for a while, that was a significant difference. Right. Yeah. I was just curious if there's, like, any reason you would actually do that, because, like, in v6, of course, we expect an interface to have multiple addresses at all times, but... So I'm going to declare another flag here. Uh, let's say interface name. Um, probably just going to use, actually, we're going to make it the uplink zero, which is the production uplink interface. Yep, sounds uh, good. Every interface name to take the first IP4 address from. And then you can just uh, override that in your go run invocation pointed to, I don't know, hello, or your actual Ethernet interface. Doesn't really matter. Yep, sounds good. Um, now we actually need to call the function, though, so uh, not so fast. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, oops. Address, uh, M, yes. OK, and then address. Who is now obsolete? Oh, 
Yeah, give it a shot. Yep, you got it. Hey, check it out. Great. Okay. Uh, do I have the lab view land configured? I don't even remember. One sec. Who was it who said on Twitter, SSH and SCP have inconsistent port flag dash lowercase p versus dash uppercase p, but consistent dash dash port in the sense that dash dash port is not implemented. <laughs> I think that was uh, I think that was Dave Anderson, and yes, that was a great tweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I have stumbled over the dash lowercase p versus dash uppercase p so often. Yeah, it's so frustrating. Yeah, um, and I think they um, uh, super annoying. Also, dash capital R versus dash lowercase r in SCP versus every other program. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the um, SSH and SCP one is particularly uh, is is particularly bad in the sense that uh, I think when they introduced it in SCP, they were like, oh yeah, so there's a flag difference here. We acknowledge this, and this is because we're compatible to RCP, which was the uh, remote copy version before encryption was a thing that you would want to do on network links. Um, so in order to keep it consistent with the like way too old thing, they missed the chance to unify them which is, oh man, such a missed opportunity. It's legitimately horrifying, like if you think about it, <laughs> you know, because how long has it been since somebody has used RCP? But I guess then again, I don't know how long SCP has been around either, but. <laughs> many, many years. Yep. Uh, uh, by the way, this works just fine with different interfaces. So I, I grabbed the interface that's on my lab VLAN and it pulled the IP just fine. So beautiful. Uh, I guess if the length of records it's zero. We're just going to like exit early. Yeah. Right? Nothing to do. Um, and then we're going to do the work of fetching the address because if the address can't be fetched, we don't need to loop over the records either. Yep. And then we're going to say, just going to loop over this uh, and run an update for each one. Is this the kind of thing you'd want to do concurrently? I guess it probably doesn't matter, but. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter because the number of records is going to be so small. Right. Um, it doesn't matter if you have like high latency, but really, like, what is one more second if you're just updating your um, IP address after reconfiguring things? Yep. Um, people will still have the old IP address in the cache, so it doesn't really matter if this is super fast or not. Um, the additional concurrency will just be um, more potential for bugs, right? Um, True. So let's do it without, for simplicity's sake, for today. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, so actually what we're gonna do now is um, resolve this as well, right? Because <clears throat> why not at this point? Uh, actually, if the token from the environment is set, it always overrides it. Uh, actually, I think there was a, wasn't there a, um, Uh, what am I looking for? The uh, OS package, get in. I think there was a variant that would tell you whether something was actually in the environment. I don't think look I remember. Oh, lookup env. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's, that's wild. Lookup env, uh, capital E, if T okay. So then we don't need to do the inbound signaling with the empty string. We can just say if it is in the in the environment, we're always going to say if you a token equals T. You know, I've been using Go for like seven years now, and I don't think I've ever noticed that API before. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I much prefer that. I prefer the second return value. So if, if you know, 1.5. If you haven't checked the OS package since 1.5, that's why it's new. Yep. I mean, wow. Today I learned. <laughs> Quickly, this expected opening paren. But this looks correct to me. Uh, can you uh, run and see? Exit early. Records up to date. Hey. Oh, yeah. Let's try it with... Uh... Oh, yeah. You can just flip-flop between the two now for testing. Indeed, I can. That works perfectly. Okay. Uh, nice. So I don't know why the language server is out of date here um, and how to restart it. Uh, I think there's a command to do so, actually. Uh, restart. Go. Sure. There we go. Okay. I'm not sure if you're using the same instance I am, though, but it's restarted now. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, record. What does it complain? Request language server failed with message. It, it won't tell me. Okay. Wait. <laughs> Wait. 
Renaming this var C of G to record would cause this reference to become shadowed by this intervening var definition. Uh, okay, um, so we already have a record in here somewhere. Oh yeah, this one. Yes. Here. So it won't let us. Oh. Um, would you not just call this R? The range variable. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Uh, probably fine. It's like it fits on one screen, so. That's yeah. Fine. Right, that's kind of my whole thing. Is I, I tend to use short variable names, but also I'm pretty strict about function like lengths anyway. So it, it works out for me. Yep. Okay. Do, um, do you want to apply some kind of like context timeout with this, like five seconds or something? I mean, just for sanity. Yes. Though um, I feel like we should probably have like a pretty long timeout here. Um, okay. Like let's say a minute, right? Because if we're like, if we're gonna do a loop, uh, I'm gonna pull this for for a minute. Um, right. We need to fix the config Cloudflare bit now. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, so we need to pass this in. This comes from, yeah, we need to pass in the Cloudflare API token. Oh, it's actually associated with each record. Never mind. What? I guess yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, Terrence. Out, um, yet, but I, I think that's probably okay. Okay. For simplicity for now. Sure. Sounds good to me. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, oh yeah. So now we probably also want the uh, long running nature of the program, right? Um, so I'm gonna add a new flag, um, and at this point, I'm gonna make this a var block. Yeah, a var block for sure. Uh, I like to leave like an empty line in between logical units of things, and for flags, is usually for each one of them, unless they're like related. Um, in general, this helps me navigate through code because then I can just uh, use like whichever key binding it is to jump to the next paragraph of text. Um, and I like that. I'm actually the exact same way. And I was curious if you were, because I know some people like to have just like a wall of text and I can't stand it. <laughs> yeah. some, of, some of the stuff in the standard library makes me so upset. So we have a one-off flag here. So we're going to say, um, just going to do a for loop here. If one-off is true, then this was the last iteration. And otherwise, we're going to sleep for one minute, and then it will repeat. So this is how we're going to do the polling. Looks if good. we run it now, it should be long running. Uh, or yeah, with the one-off, uh, it should just be one. Yes. Try both. OK. That's good. A, and I yep. can check the check the stack if we'd like. Um, let's see here. No, no. I mean, I believe it, but okay. I believe it, I believe it too, but. Yep. Uh, I oh wait no, it's net poll. Why is there an HTTP server in here? Did I see that? <laughs> oh, it's um, it's clients and stuff. Okay. Yeah. It must be it must be the connections remained open. Okay. Yeah, looks good to me. Cool. Um, so let's see. Um, this was command. We have internal. Uh, let's just go through all of this one more time to make sure we don't have any glaring omissions or anything. Should we remove um, the I logs? And then figure this out. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of, of log messages in here, which is, I think we're going to remove them. Um, I'm good with that. this so that the output is clean because um so i think you know if we're going to do debugging of the cloudflare package in the future i think the log messages are going to be in that package yes um, and in here um there's really no wait there is one more message oh yeah the exit early that is okay that's fine yeah um yeah so we're going to keep the log output clean here um no need to be overly verbose no news are good news we haven't okay. uh, we haven't updated this test in quite a while. Yep. Um, does it still work? <laughs> I have no idea. Let's find out. Uh, it does, but I don't think it's doing anything, right? It's just calling set records with no. Yep. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we added a couple of things here, so like this could be something that we might want to update a little bit, but also we're like running up again like a four hour time, so yep. maybe call it for the day. Yep. 
Yep, yep. Yeah, we can totally do it. I think the, the test, um, even though it might not be complete, it has still helped us. Like it is something that documents more of our intent. Um, and if we need to do modifications in the future uh, to get something working, we can very easily pick off here where we left off. Yeah, totally. Um, so do you want to like go through our pending changes and make a git commit out of it? Yes, absolutely. Me. Okay. Uh, tidy. Oh, I guess this wasn't tidied before. Um, no, I think, oh, did you do a tidy? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it might be. So one thing you can try is now do a make test and see what comes up. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. See, now it needs to read on all stuff. Yep. That's uh. Hmm. Let's test again. Do we still have that commented out? Do we change the make file? I think we did, but uh, not enough I think arguments. We back um, in our last change, actually. I saw something fail in there. Yep. Uh, I think that might be the test in the command, actually. So command in DNS, but I don't know where the output went. Yeah, not enough arguments and call to logic. So DIN DNS test uh, 27. So logic now accepts an interface name as well as records. Oh, yeah. Because it needs to fetch the... Yeah, uh, just make it LO. I yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to suggest as well for now at least. Um... Uh, because we don't actually check the value in the update funk, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, that looks like a pass to me. Yep. There are also unsaved files. Okay. Uh, what's unsaved? It's not even sure. Oh, well. Uh, I will try to split those out so we don't add those changes. Uh... Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have tidied, huh? <laughs> Oh yeah, and you can just check out your go.sum. Yeah, I, I think I probably I think I probably should at this point. Um go.sum. Okay, so internal and the command code. Yep. Oh, so the JSON. You don't want the JSON, okay. Ah, uh start at go. Yep. We do want the go mod, but we only want parts of it, so let's see here. No. Split. Yeah, I guess just the additions of the Libdina stuff. Yes. No. 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 Uh, no. Definitely no. Uh, we don't want the make file. We don't care about the JSON. So okay. So now we have all the new code. Uh huh. Making sure there's nothing super out of place. Okay. Um. Yeah. So this time it's going to be issue 46. Yep, you got it. Mention. Oh, I guess I should. Uh, I always tend to do the one liners instead of the multiple line commits. Uh, one sec. Fixes number 46 or updates. Uh, yeah, related to or updates. Yeah, either one Updates, works. yep. Been a while since we looked at this. Uh, router seven. Very cool. Okay. Cool. Are there any questions in the chat? While we wait for our CI to pass, hopefully. <laughs> The, uh, the nighttime mode kicked down on my monitors and I realized like how orange they were until I turned it off. It's like, ah, blinding. Yeah, this is, it can be very jarring. Um, I also use Redshift uh, to do the same thing. Yep. Um, and I think whenever you open up the NVIDIA settings program, uh, for a brief moment in time, it resets like all of your tinting. So it's like a flash of white. <laughs> yeah. Back. Whoa, what just happened? 
Well, it's kind of funny today, too, because I got the, uh, I installed the Elgato key light up there, so I can actually, uh, this is pretty cool. I figured out how to curl it, but for now I can just turn it on and off. Ta-da! Nice. With, my, with my phone. But I'm going to write a Go client for that probably on stream on Monday, I think. But it should be fun. Yeah. Okay, so this looks good. Um, I think you got everything uh, staged and... Uh, as far as I can over. tell, yeah. So I guess, uh, oh, excuse me, get this deployed and see if it uh, does anything useful for you, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to, like, uh, configure a separate record. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and then we have, like, a, a little little script um, that will monitor that my main record that I'm updating with my existing program matches the record that I'm updating with the new code. Right. Um, just so that I'm sure that, you know, everything's fine. Yep, totally. Uh, yes, Monday is a public holiday in the U.S., I think I'm going to remove the good for stream label because we've done most of the work on this. Right. I'm really curious to see what the outcome is with that issue that we filed. I feel like it's yeah. just, I feel like it's an oversight, but I could be wrong. It certainly looks like an oversight to me. Mm -hmm. um, are you already subscribed on this issue? Uh, so yes, you... I believe so. Okay. Okay, this passed. Squash and merge. Perfect. Nice. Okay, um, so this will have an update. Um, yeah, I'll have to do it actually, test, etc. But one thing we can do now is um, go to code, commit, take this commit, and then go back to our bug report and say, Way we're using this package. Yep. So now they have more context uh, right. to work with. All right, cool. Um, yeah, very cool. <laughs> there are no questions in the chat. Is there anything else uh, we should talk about before we call it a day? Not that I can think of, but I guess we'll give folks a sec to see if anybody wants to chime in. For sure. Oh, I thought we got an update already, but it was just your comment on the issue. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yep. It's typical, uh, you press submit and then you're like, oh, somebody sent me a new email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Looking forward to your next stream together. Yeah, yeah hey, great. happy to help out. Alrighty. Uh, cool. Well, thank you all for hanging out. It's been a ton of fun today. It's been a super good time. Thank you, Michael, for taking the time to do this with me. This has been uh, this has been a blast. I learned a lot about Router 7, kind of some of your ideas, picking your brain. It's been a lot of fun. So thank you. Yeah. Um, it was nice to be here. Um, yeah, I think we can repeat this. Um, at this point, I think uh, the, the most pressing challenge will be to figure out which of the issues are actually good to do on, on stream. Um, one thing to look forward to, I think, is the uh, automatically switching to tethering. Um, I have not actually tagged this as a good to stream issue because there's still some research that we need to do. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea is that um, if you have a router seven and the upstream is dead for whichever reason, and you know it, it has never been dead for me in the last couple of years, but you know in case it happens, um, it would be nice to be prepared, and it would be nice to be prepared in such a way that we could just plug in like an iPhone or an Android phone via USB into the router, um, and it would automatically create an uplink connection via that uh, tethering connection. Um, and then just route the traffic over that. Um, you know, obviously it's not like it's not something you should do lightly, right? Because if you're gonna like route your entire home network over like a mobile connection, you're gonna have crazy data charges unless yes. you disconnect the <laughs> data hungry devices first. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I think this is the way that um, it should work. Like, you know, if you wanted to enable tethering, it should be a matter of just plugging in the device. Um, I haven't done any research though on how the iPhone or Android actually do tethering. I think it's it has something to do with USB networking devices. I don't know what other configuration signaling, et cetera, you need. Um, and I don't know if the two are separate, like if Android works differently than the iPhone. So a bunch more research is needed here, but um, I could totally imagine doing something here on stream. 
Um, we have a couple of other things as well, like IGMP proxying for TV7. I don't really watch TV, so I wasn't motivated up until now to actually do this. But it might be fun to do an IGMP proxy on stream. Um, mm -hmm. A number of others are just like discussions or weird bugs that I've encountered. Um, so if you have anything else, maybe, you know, we don't always need to do the router seven. Uh, we could also, as the chat suggests, uh, Wi-Fi on go crazy. No, maybe not. Um, <laughs> requires WPA supplicant. Yeah, uh, Wi-Fi is a can of worms that I don't want to open. Um, but we could totally do something go crazy related on, on here um, or some other project in Tal. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Cool. All right. Um, Maybe using a hardware feature instead of WPS. That's right. Yeah, you can read up all about this on the Go Crazy issue. You can just uh, put a put a link there. Multipath TCP on router seven. Um, maybe I don't know if multipath TCP actually has any advantages in that scenario. Um, if we don't have multiple uplinks, um, right. multiple uplinks in general tend to work not so well. Um, I was excited to use multiple uplinks a couple of years ago at an event, and it was terrible. <laughs> um, it turns out that you know having these um, asymmetric paths um, and different IP addresses and like everything just breaks down. Um, so I don't know if multipath TCP needs middle box support in that sense. I know that for example the iPhone I think uses it um, or or Max like some Apple product uses it to roam between Wi-Fi and um, wired connections or Wi-Fi and data or something whichever you have. Um, but I think that is transparent as far as middle boxes are concerned. Um, so I'm not sure if there is something to be done here, really. Um, oh, you have to agree it's not so stable. Yeah, so maybe we just won't do anything here then. <laughs> um, but if, you, if any of you have any suggestions, uh, please feel free to either just reach out to me directly on Twitter or email or just file a GitHub issue and we can discuss it there. Mm -hmm. um, suggestions welcome. Um, if it's a cool thing that I think would be fun to work on and would fit into the project well, um, we can totally do it. Pixie server with router seven. There is actually already a great Pixie server uh, written in Go, um, and I think it's Pixie Core uh, netboot slash Pixie Core. Was it really this one? Uh, no longer developed. No, I think I thought this was uh, there was a different version of this. Anyway, um, yeah, check this out. 11 months ago. So yeah, maybe I was misremembering it. I thought it was under the Google org, but yeah. Um, Pixie Court, yeah, because when Dave left Google, I think he moved his repos. Ah, yeah, that might be it. Yeah, um, that's why I was remembering it like this. Yeah, Pixie Court is great. Like it is, um, maybe they have the example here. Uh, well, that's, that's a bit of a too short TLDR, I think, but <laughs> I think they had something, oh yeah, this. Uh, so this is the command line that you need to uh, like pixie boot a core OS onto a different computer. And that's great, right? It's just like once you have pixie core installed, which is just a Go program, you have all of the all of the setup that you need to do pixie boot. So if you wanted to, you could just run pixie core on router seven already. I don't think there's any work to do. Cool, okay. Um, so yeah, enough talking about possible projects. Um, <laughs> I think I'm just gonna say uh, thank you for hanging out here. Um, subscribe to to my Twitch as well and Matt Layer's Twitch for the individual streams that we're doing from time to time. Um, and yeah, hopefully we're gonna do another co-programming session soon. Totally, yeah. Thank you all for hanging out. This has been a blast. And uh, with that, we will call it a stream. So alrighty, take care everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.